This meeting is being recorded and a replay will be available shortly afterwards. To reduce your exposure, please keep your microphones muted and use the chat box for your questions or comments and the moderator will address them. Of course, again, this is open to the public, so welcome. I am Chandra Owens, USDA liaison with the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement. I have been working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture for the last 27 years, and today we're going to share how the USDA and other federal departments are able to assist our communities. OPPE seeks to create partnerships for community prosperity, especially in rural areas in our nation. That brings together partners who are key to revitalize rural America. Through these summits, we wish to foster hope and opportunities, wealth creation, and build asset building and bring asset building to the forefront for community development. It will take all of us to make that happen. Again, the purpose of this summit Statewide Summit is to inform, educate, and connect a wide variety of stakeholders to USDA and other departments to their federal programs and state resources, especially the value of agriculture, economic, economic and community development sectors. By linking federal, state, regional, and other organizations to private and public entities, such as our partners here at the Land Grant University of Delaware State University, to our communities of farmers, ranchers, tribal nations, small businesses, nonprofits, and even our faith-based partners will have a far better chance of reducing those barriers to achieve the five priorities that have been identified. That include economic development, being able to harness technological innovations, supporting a rural workforce, having e-connectivity for rural America, that's especially important today with schools starting, and improving the quality of life for all. The panel of speakers will share the resources that they have, that they may have available for our Delawareans and surrounding states. The planning team for this summit included representatives from the Delaware State University and the US Department of Agriculture Rural Development. Now, I would like to turn it over and introduce our moderator for the day, Ms. Ann Herring, who is the Community Solution Specialist with USDA Rural Development Innovation Center. And I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Chandra, and good morning, everyone. And welcome again to our first ever Delaware Community Prosperity Summit. And we are blessed to be able to hold this electronically so we could continue on. Again, I'm Ann Herring, so welcome. Just to go over a few housekeeping details this morning, hopefully you had an opportunity to read the welcome message while you were waiting to join the meeting. We do have a wide range of speakers, a large audience, and we have built in several opportunities for you to ask questions throughout our morning. First, we have a question and answers uh, session right before the break, and again, at the end of all the presentations. You're welcome to place your question in the chat or please raise your electronic hand and we'll be able to call on you at that point in time. And we will certainly answer as many questions this morning as we possibly can during the allotted time. But once again, as Chandra pointed out, you will be able to get the recorded version to watch that again and plenty of other information if your questions do not get answered. It's all about resources today. You are muted. So please do adjust your speaker level to your personal volume. On your Zoom invitation, there should have been a telephone number if you prefer to dial in that way. Uh, we all know the electronic uh, zooming and um, broadbanding and all those bandwidth issues that, that arise. So we certainly understand that. And uh, you, all, all of our guests may wish to limit your uh, video capabilities just to help saving a little bit on, on bandwidth. Um, again, let's see, how many are we up to this morning? We were approaching 60, yes, we're fast approaching the 60 mark, which is fabulous. So with that, we will move right along to our official opening remarks. And we are just pleased as punch this morning to have the director of the USDA Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement, Mr. Mike Beatty with us. And he comes from Georgia. I understand he might've even been a coach for time or two, a little bit of farm activity and, 
and we learned a little bit ago that he might even favor uh, Jeff Bridges just a little bit. So um, <laughs> we told him he needed to touch up his lipstick just a little bit. But Mike, we're tickled you could join us. So with that, the floor is yours. And I don't know how I can live up to that introduction. I tell you what, but uh, what an honor to be here. And it's so great to have our federal partners with us also in this, this great audience. And on behalf of Secretary Purdue, whom I've known for 20 years, uh, and I love the motto, do right and feed everyone. We talk all the time about these virtual summits and the platform and the process that we as uh, one USDA have put together, I think, and we've had uh, dozens of these throughout the country. We've had uh, hundreds of communities uh, involved and really thousands of people. And But you know what? It's just great to be in Delaware. I wish I could be there in person with you, uh, kick a little dirt with you. My background is poultry and cattle farming and a coach. And But excited about USDA, the People's Department founded by Abraham Lincoln, you know, we, we've always been there. I think we'd all agree that our country in, is in a storm right now. You know, we have the pandemic going on, a lot of different things. And But I'm so proud of all of our, our federal partners and USDA uh, coming together and really bringing that obvious greater value. I'm going to bring uh, Jackie uh, Davis Slay up in just a second. But I'm going to tell you this, just share this with you. As a coach, I always love the idea of a huddle. And in so many ways, you know, this is a community huddle. This is folks coming together from various backgrounds to really figure out how to get the job done. And Denise and I, I think, Denise, we met on one of the first huddles we had up in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, and it's so, so, so great to have you here today and our FSA folks, Robin and Casey, our state conservationists. But you know, what we want to do is come together and really bring that value. And we talk about hope and opportunity. And let me say this, Chandra, I'm so proud of you. Lady, you've just done a great job pulling this together. These aren't easy, and we know that, but they are a great platform moving forward. We hope by the end of next year we will have been in all 50 states. So uh, just proud of you on behalf of the Secretary. Uh, looking forward to the great conversations today. Jackie, I'm going to hand the ball off to you. And uh, Jackie's kind of my key quarterback in the huddle. And uh, Jackie Davis Slay is one of those tireless workers that I met a couple of years ago is our deputy director and just doing a great job. So Jackie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And um, I want to thank our Delaware State Food and Agriculture Council for really partnering us in the Delaware State University. Uh, and we, we've met in the past, and thank you again from SRDC. You know, you are a great partner. But, you know, the, the, the true partner out there are our customers, and we are here to bring those resources uh, that's available to really assist you with your needs. You know, we have five principal areas that we look at economic development, community development, workforce development, innovation and technology and broadband. And through these federal resources and our private resources, we have the tools that are, that can really get the job done. Uh, we ask that you all come together in your communities um, and form what we call local prosperity councils. You'll hear a little bit more about that at the end, but really to, identify challenges and issues that your communities are facing. Uh, Delaware is uh, one of my favorite areas to come visit. I love Rehoboth Beach because I love shopping there. <laughs> so, you know, it's always a joy. And I wish uh, we could be there in person, like Mike says. But, you know, uh, bringing together these federal partners and our private sector partners uh, in a holistic fashion, we really can change lives and, and really address the needs and challenges uh, that face our country today. This pandemic, you know, it has hindered us a lot, but we are still on the job and we are still here ready to serve you all as our customer base. So, you know, I want to thank you for welcoming me in Delaware and I want to thank you for welcoming USDA and I want to thank you for welcoming um, uh, OPPE. And really, I want to thank Mike for giving uh, me this opportunity to serve as your deputy. And last but not least, I want to thank our USDA liaison, Chandra. Like I said, you've done a great job in pulling this together. And we will be getting to Delaware in person in some time in the near future. But, you know, thank you all for being here on this rainy Thursday. But, you know, without the rain, we sometimes we wouldn't enjoy the sunshine. So peace and blessings.
thank you, Jackie and Mike. Wonderful opening remarks. And if you have not picked up on it, we have a real partnership theme going this morning. Our host is the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement. I serve on our partnerships team at Rural Development. And all of you all on this call are our partners to greater things. So with that, we'll introduce our, our next host. And we could not have gotten along with the folks from Delaware State University, where Chandra is located. And this morning we have Dr. Sandra DeLauder with us, who is the provost. So Dr. DeLauder, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you, Anne. On behalf of President Tony Allen, the Board of Trustees, the administration, faculty, staff, and students of Delaware State University, we welcome you to the Delaware Community Prosperity Summit. Since its founding in 1891 as a land-grant institution, thanks to the Second Morale Act of 1890, Delaware State University has been dedicated to providing access to quality higher education for limited resource populations, especially African Americans. Our symbiotic relationship with the USDA, established in the 1970s, has provided federal funding to support the continuity of our agriculture and related science programs, and has undergirded our devotion to the tripartite mission of teaching research and extension that benefits Delaware State University students and Delawareans throughout the state. Today, Delaware State University continues to deliver excellence in our degree programs that foster globally competent future leaders and our outreach education programs that help create a more informed and productive citizenry. The partnership between the USDA and the 1890 land grant universities is necessary to sustain institutions like Delaware State University. This vital partnership provides programs like the Capacity Building and Facilities Grant that offer DSU needed funds to reinforce our ability to develop future scientists and leaders with state-of-the-art facilities and to discover new ways to tackle challenges in the food and nutrition, agriculture, renewable industry, and forestry sectors. Evans Allen Research and Extension Formula Funding Programs provide additional support to our investigative work in the aforementioned areas that is then incorporated into outreach educational materials by our Extension staff to help our fellow Delawareans increase and sustain the profitability of their small farms, improve nutrition and health behaviors of their families, and provide life skills and leadership training for their children. All of our extension programs are provided for, for free or at minimal cost to re reach underserved populations. Additionally, our partnership with USDA affords students interested in pursuing degrees at Delaware State University in agriculture, natural resources, food and nutrition and other related science pathways to careers in those fields thanks to the 1890 scholarship program and the Delaware State University College of Agricultural Science and Technology 1890 Agricultural Scholarships Program. These funds relieve recipients, many of them first-generation college students, of the costly burden associated with the pursuit of higher education while providing them with degrees that prepare them for work in the highly skilled arena of food and agricultural systems. Through the integration of teaching research and extension on our campus, we open our eyes and doors and encourage future leaders to give back to help sustain their home communities and our nation. Delaware State University was identified as a center of community prosperity by USDA to help lead the effort to convene state, federal, and tribal partners, local governments, nonprofit organizations, faith leaders, veterans, and other strategic partners to focus on initiatives that build capacity, especially in our more rural areas. Today is just the beginning of creating the necessary connections to agents and programs that may bolster our economy and improve the quality of life for those who call Delaware the first state home. Again, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you this morning and welcome. 
Well, again, thank you, Dr. DeLauder. It's always wonderful to catch up on all the good things going on on campus. So thanks for getting us up to speed on that and continue those great works. Next on our list of opening remarks is Deputy Secretary Kenny Bounds with the Delaware Department of Agriculture. And I understand he has nearly four decades of serving Delaware farmers, having retired from the Mid-Atlantic Farm Credit System. So Kenny, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ann, but it can't be four decades, I'm sure. I'm not that <laughs> old. Uh, and Dr. DeLauder, I want you to, to issue an edict to Dr. Marsh that he can't tell our mutual minister that I have not returned to the pew in church yet. Uh, uh, so you be sure to talk to him after this call, okay? Co cover me. There's so many friends and, uh, and partners on this call. It's great to see you all again. It really is important. We do good stuff together, folks. And uh, USDA and the universities and everybody else on the call, uh, we really work together. Somebody mentioned it earlier, Chandra, I think it might've been you, but it's, it's about, or it might've been Mike, um, about our customers. Uh, and, you know, collectively, we, I think, have really done a great job during extremely trying times. Uh, it's, it's really been crazy over the last six months. And, you know, I think it's getting better. We've learned to adapt. We've learned to, to Zoom and lots of other things. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for everybody that's uh, been a real valued partner um, uh, with us in this. And Mike, uh, when you see Secretary Purdue, thank him. Uh, thank him for all that he does and the agency that he runs. The Farmers to Food Box program uh, is a thing that's really helping some of our farmers and a lot of folks right now. So, so thanks again. Secretary Skews brings his welcome to you as well. He couldn't be with us today. But he wanted me to bring you up to date on how COVID-19 has affected Delaware agriculture. And, you know, the impacts, they're widespread, so it's hard to, it's really hard to talk about them all. But four main things. One of those is our poultry industry, which accounts for 75% of our gross farm income in Delaware. Consumer access to food. The ability to maintain a migrant and seasonal workforce safely. And holding large events like the state fair or livestock auctions or other things like that. Um, all of those have been, been impacted uh, tremendously. One of our poultry companies saw such a huge hit to their workforce that they had to stop processing altogether. And they lost over 4 million birds uh, to depopulation uh, because of that. And of course, we had to euthanize those birds in the poultry facilities compost them there, which left growers then with extended layout times and reduced cash flow. And uh, we're hoping to, uh, to maybe put together some federal funds for some relief for them uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, but that's, that's really been a big, big impact. The other companies that had maybe more than one processing plant that did not have to euthanize in-house but they still had more birds coming through the line than they could process and send for deboning or cut up. And a lot of those birds got diverted off and sent out for rendering. So we lost a lot of meat uh, that would have been available to the consumers uh, during that time period. And it was really traumatic for everyone uh, and not the least of which was the consumers uh, at the other end. I will say our company stepped up, uh, we saw, uh, I think all of them actually have um, food distribution sites around the state. They pulled up refrigerated tractor trailers and they were, they were selling 10 pound bags of boneless chicken breast for $10. And that was right at the peak of, of consumers being really afraid about their food supply. And people waited in line for over an hour to get to that food. So kudos to them for, for, um, for how they stepped up. They also stepped up early on and, and worked with our uh, State Department of Health and many others in providing protection for workers. And, you know, we, we got this workforce returned to work pretty quickly considering the number of people and the close proximity in which they work in the plants. And they put up shields, uh, they tried to social distance where they could, uh, and of course they're checking for temperature and all those other, other things. So. The companies uh, really stepped up in a big way. Um, you know, a lot of what they've done um, 
couldn't have been done without, without help from CDC, from USDA, uh, from people on, on this phone, from private agencies. Um, so there's a lot of partners again, and like you said, Chandra, the word partner, uh, I think is being used a lot here today or, or Anne, um, and I think you'll hear that throughout, uh, throughout the course. And, you know, regarding, um, regarding Delaware food supply, then we, we took a little bit of grief early on when we said that we were not going to open our, uh, farmers markets, uh, when they wanted to open. So typically that season kicks off in late uh, April or early May, but we wanted to sh make sure we had the right protocols in place. Th they become a rather, right much of a social gathering location as well as a um, food distribution place. So we worked with them and, and uh, they submitted uh, ideas to us on how we could get that done. So along with our Department of Health, we finally did, uh, did get that done. We limited uh, the types of products, the number of people that could be waiting in line, things like that. But um, like everyone here, we worked our way through it uh, one, one step at a time. We also restricted there the types of vendors, you know, that, that <clears throat> what type of food, like food trucks and things like that. So again, we took a little bit of heat for that, but, um, you know, we, we tried to do what we felt was, was the right thing. I think the biggest message of all is that we took a cross agency approach to making sure that all of this happened. I don't know why I was so surprised that it, that it worked so well. There were so many challenges, but most of my career has been in agriculture, as Ann mentioned, and I really hadn't worked with Department of Health very much uh, and labor and others. And I was really pleasantly surprised with, with how everybody, uh, you know, put their shoulder in and just, we got the job done, and that includes with our federal partners also. And um, it was really good to see. It's good to know that in times of adversity, you can come together, that you can make it happen, and and um, people really do care about other people. That's 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 the good thing. So um, we certainly hope we're through with with this. You know, maybe we have some vaccines on the horizon. Um, we'll have to see. Uh, at the Department of Ag, we have remained open the entire time uh, with a somewhat of a skeleton crew. As you can tell, I'm telecommuting today, but this is the first day I've worked from home and I don't know, I've been in probably every day for the last two weeks. Uh, prior to that, for quite a long time, as Secretary Skews told me, quote, you're old and compromised, go home and don't come back, end quote. <laughs> so, he, uh, you know, he meant that in a good way, uh, obviously, but uh, a lot of us have had to work from home and. Uh, we still got the job done for our customers. So I hope you have a great conference. Thank you for including us. Moving forward, if there's anything that we can do to partner with you, please always ask. Uh, we're available uh, at any time, and uh, we look forward to the conversation. Well, thank you, Kenny. Great to hear what's going on at the State Department of Ag, and there's nothing old and compromised about you, much less the efforts there <laughs> in your department. And uh, so great that you touched on our food supply. I heard President Trump say in a news clip that he identified our, our food chain and food supply as critical infrastructure. And I think that's one of the pandemic positives that has resulted that if we weren't aware how critical that is, we certainly are now. So that's good for all of us in, in the ag industry. So next, we're moving right on along with the agenda to our USDA agency support. And our, our great leader and host for the day is Next, Ms. Denise Lovelady. She is the State Director for Delaware and Maryland, both states. She was appointed by President Trump nearly three years ago. Time has clicked by, and she brings more than 20 years of executive and management experience to uh, her position from both public and the private sector. And her focus for the last several years has been to understand the issues that rural communities struggle in Delaware and Maryland, and to work to try to improve that. Henceforth, the reason some of which for the summit today. So Denise, the floor is yours. Take it away. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, great to be with you and um, great to have everybody here joining us this morning. As uh, Anne mentioned, um, I am State Director for uh, Delaware and Mar Maryland for Rural Development. And I have the great and distinct honor of being named the 
the first state director that hails from the state of Maryland, just kind of throwing that in there. Um, so this summit today has uh, actually been a, in a long time in the making. I believe my journey began last summer when I attended Coach Beatty's inaugural summit up in Philadelphia and, 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 and presented this whole uh, idea of prosperity summits throughout the country. Um, we've had a few fits and starts planning our Delaware, Maryland meeting, so I particularly want to thank Chandra Owens with the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement for her perseverance and getting this summit scheduled. Uh, I'm certain she must have felt like she was hurting cats at times, but um, she's a pro and she got us organized and here with you all this morning. And Anne, thank you for those great remarks at the beginning here. and. Um, uh, your job with the Innovation Center is great. You've been a great help to me and, and Delaware, Maryland. And I also want to give a shout out to Damian Taylor. Damian is World Development's Public Information Specialist. And just to let you know, he's going to be tweeting out messages about the summit taking place today. So thanks, Damian. And also want to give a special thanks to Dr. DeLauder and Delaware State University for co-hosting the summit along with World Development. Can we advance the slide, please? <clears throat> so I want to talk to you, start my, uh, with talking about rural development's mission. Rural development is one of seven mission areas within USDA, and RD is Rural America's partner in prosperity as we are the lead federal agency helping rural communities grow and prosper. We are ready to assist communities so they are self-sustaining and economically thriving through investments that create ladders of opportunity, build regional resilience, and support the growth of emerging markets. We have more than 40 different, 40 plus loaning grants and technical assistance programs to support economic development. We provide the tools and resources that ensure rural families, businesses, and communities have the help they need to thrive today and in the future. RD is the catalyst for prosperity in improving high-speed internet access, providing affordable housing, connecting uh, citizens to new uh, skill sets for jobs of the future, modernizing water systems, and ensuring communities have access to healthcare. Rural America is hometown America, and it's more important than just a place, a great place to live, RD is integral to the spirit and character of America, and RD helps to provide Americans the everyday essentials. Uh, the next slide, please. So I just want to give you a little bit of background on how big uh, rural development is. We have four regions, the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, and the West. We have 47 state offices, 400 area offices, one national office located in DC, uh, a business center um, that hails from the St. Louis area for customer service, and the Innovation Center, which Anne is a part of, is located in DC. So my organization, World Development, is open for business here in Delaware, Maryland. We have three offices. Our state office here is located in Dover, Delaware, on College Park Drive, which is just adjacent or behind Delaware State University. And we also have offices in Hagerstown and La Plata, Maryland. We are definitely a compact organization with talented, skilled field staff committed to helping improve the economy and quality of life in rural Delaware and Maryland. And the next slide, please. So on here, you have a, 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 a link to all of our programs um, and you'll have this uh, presentation. We're recording it as, as Anne mentioned. And so you'll be able to access all the information because I'm going to have to go through this pretty quickly since we have 40 different programs. So uh, here is listed the link that you will find all the information. And can we move on to the next slide? Thanks. So these are the three mission areas within rural development. We have um, uh, rural business and cooperative service, rural housing, and rural utility service. Um, I'll begin with the business programs. They are my favorite, but don't tell anybody. Uh, the business programs have more than 12 po po yeah, programs in its portfolio. It provides financial backing and technical assistance to stimulate business creation and growth. The programs work through partnerships with public and private 
community developed community based organizations and financial institutions to provide financial assistance, business development, and technical assistance to rural businesses. These programs help to provide capital, equipment, space, job training, and entrepreneurial skills that can help start or grow businesses. The business pro programs also support the creation and preservation of quality of jobs in rural areas. And I, I'm, since we're limited on time, I, 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 I really want to point out that, that, that you look um, on those links to the, to the information about our programs. In the business area, the, uh, the most popular programs are our Rural Energy for Assistance Program, our BNI uh, Business and Industry Guarantees, our Rural Business Development Grants, and our Value Added Producer Grants. And you can um, find information on them. Um, we have fact sheets on everything. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and continue on with the other uh, program areas. Um, next, we'll, we'll go to the housing service, and housing uh, encompasses a lot more than just uh, houses. So we have our single family housing direct program, and we also refer to it as our 502 direct loan. This program assists low and very low income applicants obtain decent, safe, and sanitary housing in eligible rural areas by providing payment assistance to increase an applicant's repayment ability. Payment assistance in the type of subsidy that reduces the mortgage payment for a short time. The amount of assistance is determined by the adjusted family income. Very popular in Delaware. We are over our allocation almost every year, and this year is no different. I think we're right about at 132% of our allocation and close to using all of our allocation in Maryland. We're about at 87% there, so we have some way to go in Maryland. Um, we also have a single family guaranteed program, which is not managed in the states anymore. This is a, a national program and, the, and the, they work directly with the lenders to provide a guarantee, um, which works a lot like the uh, VA program. Um, so um, that can be found on our, on our website as well. So getting back to what we do here, we also have what's called a single family housing repair loan and grant program. And this is noted to be our 504 home repair program. This provides loans to very low income homeowners to repair, improve, or modernize their homes um, through grants and grants to the elderly, very low income homeowners to remove health and safety hazards. We also have the multifamily housing um, loan guarantee. Um, this is now being managed nationally as well. And just to let you know, um, before they transitioned and realigned with the national office, between Maryland and Delaware, we have over 200 properties. And um, this is, we are servicing them um, still in Delaware, but um, the, this will be managed through the national office going forward. Um, and one of our most popular programs and, and used is the Community Facilities Direct Loan and Grant Program. This program provides affordable funding to develop essential community facilities in rural areas. An essential community facility is defined as a facility that provides an essential service to the local community for the orderly development of the community in primarily rural areas and does not include private, commercial, or business undertakings. Um, eligible borrowers include public bodies, community-based nonprofit corporations, and federally recognized tribes. And the funds can be used to purchase, construct, or improve essential facilities, purchase equipment, and pay related project expenses. Examples of essential community facilities would include like healthcare facilities such as hospitals, uh, medical clinics, dental clinics, nursing homes, and assisted living facilities. But also um, town halls, courthouses, airport hangars, and street improvements. Well, a good example of that is in, in the town of Georgetown, we did the administration building and the town hall, and it was just dedicated last um, fall, as a matter of fact. Um, community support services such as child care centers also included, community centers, fairgrounds, or transitional housing. Public safety services such as fire departments, police stations, prisons, police vehicles, uh, an example of what we funded, we did a car for the town of Seaford, a police car for the town of Seaford to help, help advance their Seaford Goes Purple uh, 
movement to help uh, fight the opioid epidemic. We also can provide fire trucks, public work vehicles or equipment. And another example of what we funded, we did for the Delaware Food Bank, we funded a uh, refrigerated truck for them uh, last year. And moving on, uh, we also have had educational services such as museums, libraries, or private schools. And two great examples that we funded last year was the Sussex Montessori School. And also we did the Del Mar Library Expansion Project, which is an amazing renovation and much needed in small towns like Del Mar. Um, also, utility, um, local food systems and community gardens, food pantries, community kitchens, food banks, food hubs, or greenhouses. So you can see this is a very versatile per, uh, program. Um, we really uh, enjoy doing these types of um, projects. So um, this is something that uh, really helps small communities. Um, our third area is the rural utility service. So um, in those Rural Utilities um, provides much needed infrastructure for infrastructure improvements to rural communities. These include water and waste treatment, electric power, and telecommunication services. All of these services help expand economic opportunities and improve uh, quality of life uh, in rural areas. So we have our water programs. Um, we refer to that as WEP, Water and Environmental Programs. And um, uh, we provide loans, grants, and loan guarantees for drinking water, sanitary sewer, solid waste, and storm drainage facilities in rural areas. Cities and towns, they must be, uh, have a population of 10,000 or less, and public bodies, nonprofit organizations, and recognized tribes, they qualify for this assistance. We also have our electric programs. Um, the electric programs provide capital and leadership to maintain, expand, upgrade, and modernize America's vast rural electric infrastructure. Um, this is not something that's uh, very much utilized in Delaware or Maryland now, but years ago uh, we did. We funded the electric co-ops here in Delaware. Um, we also funded um, Chop Tank Electric in Maryland and the Southern Maryland uh, co-op too. Um, most of these agent, most of these um, um, co-ops have uh, been former customers and we continue to keep relationships open with them, um, even though uh, um, we're not doing, uh, creating a more other uh, cooperatives recently. So something to keep in mind for the future. And our big area uh, in the utility service is the telecommunications program. Um, this provides uh, it, uh, 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 capital for rural telecommunications infrastructure. Um, we have several programs and um, we are committed to ensuring that rural areas have access to affordable, reliable, advanced telecommunication services comparable to those living in the rest of the United States. Um, recently, um, we have um, funded our, our first ReConnect Award, which went to uh, a county in the state of Maryland. And um, uh, I think it was uh, through grants, uh, through our ReConnect program, it was about $13.1 million, and it was just awarded at the end of July. So that was the very first ReConnect here in this area. Um, we also have a Community Connect program, and there's also funding through some of our other programs as well for telecommunication. Um, let's see. Um, also, DLT, Distance Learning and Telemedicine, which is so important nowadays as we're, as we're managing through COVID. Um, our first and second round funding awards will be announced soon. I know we had one applicant in Delaware, um, which uh, I don't know if it's, if it's been awarded yet, but we will certainly um, keep you up to date on that. Um, there will be more funding coming out for all of our telecom programs and DLT. So um, uh, check back with us if that's something that you're interested in and in advancing, the, especially the, the distance learning telemedicine. Um, can we advance the slide, please? Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about what rural development has done to um, help with the COVID-19 situation. We have resources. To support our rural communities and neighbors affected by COVID-19 outbreak, rural development has launched a web page that contains a collection of resources related to the pandemic, pandemic response. 
the content is updated and refreshed daily to ensure the latest and most accurate information is available to the public, including stakeholder announcements and new resources. A series of frequently asked questions are available and being updated for borrowers and stakeholders. Links to the CDC and USDA main websites to access federal partner resources as well. And could you advance the slide, please? Actually, uh, advance it one more. Thank you. Okay. So um, on this page, this is our COVID, this is the federal COVID-19 resource page. Uh, the Rural Development Innovation Center and the Office of External Affairs collaborated to create the COVID-19 federal resource guide. This guide lists all federal funding and services resources for rural communities, businesses, healthcare facilities, and residents impacted by COVID-19. The guide will also help rural leaders, whether they be in local government, education, healthcare, faith leadership, or any other capacity, understand what federal assistance is available and, and can help them in, during these unprecedented times. Um, can you advance the slide, please? So I mentioned back when I was talking about our business programs that we had a, a, a business and industry uh, loan guarantee. And there was a special funding that came out um, this summer that is, a, is also a business and in industry guaranteed loan program, but the funding comes from the CARES Act. And this particular um, uh, guaranteed program is just a little bit different. Um, it's, uh, it has, we've been granted 20 million in program funding and it's enough to subsidize up to 1 billion in lending authority. The repayment terms have been increased um, with options for deferment. Operational expenses include payroll, salaries, benefits, as well as facilities costs, supplies, and inventory are eligible. This program is open and all funds until all funds are obligated. So this will, this will be around for a while. I know we've had several businesses in the Delaware area that have taken advantage of this already. So this is one of the resources that rural development has to fight, uh, to help combat the um, COVID uh, situation. Can you advance the slide again, please? So um, this is our main website. You'll see all of our, our, our links here to USDA Rural Development, uh, the coronavirus um, information, as well as um, our, Gov and you, hopefully you will just subscribe to our Gov Delivery um, subscription. Maybe most of you already subscribe to that because I guess that's how you found out about today's summit. So I'll leave you with this. I wanna thank you again for all, tuning in. Um, the very last slide I have is our contact information. Can you advance the slide one more time? Right there is all the uh, contacts for Delaware and Maryland. You'll find us all located on there and we hope that we will be hearing from you soon and help you grow and prosper. Thank you for the time this morning. I appreciate it. Turning it back to you, Anne. Thank you, Denise. Wonderful remarks on the latest and greatest happening at USDA Rural Development. And we are still under the USDA Agency Support section of our uh, platform this morning. Next is one of what we call our sister agencies here at Rural Development, the uh, USDA Farm Service Agency. We couldn't get along without our, our sisters in crime. Next, we have Robin Talley. She is the program specialist as well as the district director for uh, USDA Farm Service Agency there in, in Delaware. And she is responsible for administering the federal farm programs delivered out of those offices. So Robin, welcome and thank you for your remarks. Take it away. Good morning, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna I guess focus my remarks this morning about some of the things that Farm Service Agency is doing in Delaware and across the country, um, but I'm going to focus on um, the resources that we have available here in Delaware. Uh, next slide, please. So the Farm Service Agency is an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. 
and we are charged with delivering um, loans and agricultural programs to farmers, ranchers, and agricultural partners. Uh, the agency provides America's farmers with a strong safety net through the administration of farm commodity and disaster programs and Farm Service Agency's longstanding tradition of conserving the nation's natural resources continues through the Conservation Reserve Program. The agency provides credit to agricultural producers who are unable to receive private commercial credit, including special emphasis on beginning minority and women farmers and ranchers. And we also purchase and deliver commodities for use in international humanitarian food programs. Uh, so three primary, you know, the programs and services come through three primary areas, uh, commodity and disaster programs, conservation programs, and loan programs. Uh, the next slide, please. So our safety net programs are generally geared towards producers of agricultural commodities like corn, soybeans, milk, livestock, fruits, and vegetables. Uh, these programs are designed to provide assistance in times of low prices, market disruptions, natural disasters, uh, that kind of thing. In Delaware, we issued just over $27 million in payments for these programs in uh, fiscal year 2020. So, uh, you know, the farm economy is, um, has really had a hard time in 2020. A lot of the, the economy overall is struggling in 2020. It's been a difficult year. And so these kinds of programs that are listed here, um, you know, generally trigger in, like I said, with low prices and uh, market disruptions. And so, you know, the focus here is to support farmers who in turn create jobs and feed us uh, and keep those businesses uh, strong and able to continue in operation. Next slide, please. Uh, disaster programs address a variety of situations. Uh, and so, for example, the Emergency Conservation Program helps restore cropland that's damaged by tornadoes or floods. And, you know, that's happened in Delaware in the last couple of years. We've had activity in the Emergency Conservation Program. Uh, right now, our offices are working on crop loss claims due to Hurricanes Florence and Michael in 2018. So even though that was a quite a while ago, uh, you know, we are, sometimes it takes a while for programs to roll out, but we are delivering benefits to producers who were affected. Uh, we had substantial crop losses due to those two hurricanes back in 2018, and we are working through that process right now. And I know that that assistance is very much appreciated uh, here in Delaware. So there's a long list of, um, app of programs there that are targeted to disaster uh, protection and recovery. Um, you know, depending on what's happening at different times, any one of those could be available to farmers in Delaware. The next uh, slide, please. Okay, our farm loan programs. Um, 2020 has been, uh, we've issued more loans in 2020 across the country than at any time in the history of the agency. It's been a very busy year in loan programs. Um, one of the really good things about the loan programs that we offer are just our uh, experience with agriculture. Uh, farmers, you know, it's a very um, difficult business. It, it's cyclical and it's also subject to um, the impact of weather. There's a lot of unforeseen things. And in traditional lending, that can be a very difficult situation. People need to understand uh, the business of agriculture in order to make loans. And so we're very proud of the loan officers that we have and their ability to work with farmers and support them with their credit needs. So the first, this group of farm loan programs that you see listed here, um, they're available to farmers who may be unable to secure financing because of economic hardship or because they're just starting out. Maybe they're, um, you know, beginning to farm, uh, they might not have the down payment to secure a loan through traditional means. They might not have sufficient experience that a lender wants to take a chance on them. And so that's the purpose of these programs is to help farmers get started and obtain the credit they need. Or, uh, you know, there's even farmers who have farmed for quite a long time can hit a rough patch in their farming operation due to weather or economics or, you know, some other situation. 
uh, and so we can help them through that hardship as well. So funding is targeted to beginning minority and women farmers. Um, and in Delaware, our loan portfolio includes poultry, grain, livestock, and specialty crop operations. Um, it's our loan program, we work with lenders um, on those guaranteed loans to make sure that credit is available. Um, we have a lot of partnerships with uh, lenders, so we're uh, proud of those loan programs as well. The last two listed on that page, marketing assistance loans and farm storage facility loans are available to all farmers. They don't have to be um, you know, just starting out. They can be established farmers. And the purpose of those loans is to facilitate the orderly marketing of crops. So with marketing assistance loans, um, farmers might uh, hold their crop on the farm and not sell it until the spring uh, to market it later in the year and uh, that marketing assistant loan provides them with some income so that they can hold those crops and market them later. Uh, facility loans are just what they say. Uh, the farmer can build cold storage or a grain bin, some kind of storage facility on the farm to hold their crops until they're ready to market them. Uh, also very good programs uh, all across the country and here in Delaware. The next slide, please. Okay, the conservation programs uh, that we administer are designed to improve water quality and wildlife by converting sensitive cropland to conservation uses like ponds, trees, and grasses. Uh, farmers with farm ownership loans can use conservation contracts to manage their land for conservation, recreation, or wildlife purposes. And so these programs uh, we administer with um, in partnership with the state of Delaware and with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, we try to encourage farmers to take some of their land uh, out of crop production and put it into conservation reserve program to create natural areas and improve water quality. The next slide, please. Some of the other things that Farm Service Agency does, which are important for rural communities, um, uh, Farm Service Agency coordinates disaster declarations, designations and declarations. So in instances like, uh, you know, a hurricane hits an area and causes widespread losses, um, sometimes it's drought, some kind of condition that causes um, a disaster condition in, an, in a county, uh, Farm Service Agency works with our partners at the state and in USDA and at the universities to assess the damage to crops and request designations by the secretary, or if it's bad enough, um, it's possible that we would have a presidential declaration. So those designations and declarations are important to make uh, resources available to farmers in the event of a disaster. One of the other things that we do is maintain records on basically all of the farms and farmers across the country. Uh, Farm Service Agency is the repository for that data uh, we basically collect information on how many acres they, a farmer tills, you know, where the land is, um, what the, how much of it's in cropland, how much is in woodland, uh, all that kind of thing, names and addresses. It's important information, uh, partly for just disaster purposes so that we can track what's out there and share that information as necessary with our partners. Uh, there are about two million farmers across the country, and so there's a lot of data out there about farms and farmland. Uh, our organic certification cost share program is uh, just another smaller program where we assist producers with organic, um, who are organic, in the process of getting organic certified. The next slide, please. Okay, so Farm Service Agency delivers these programs um, all across the country through a network of USDA service centers. We have an office in almost every county in the country. In Delaware, um, our offices are in Newark, Dover, and Georgetown, uh, all co-located with other USDA agencies. Um, and, you know, it's easy for producers to find us on the internet. All of our offices are, um, we've been open uh, throughout COVID-19, we've been open um, with varying levels of staff. At this point, we are open. Um, all of our staff is in the office. Uh, we are not 
we are open by appointment only for producers. And so, um, we, you know, we can do business over the internet by phone, or we can have producers in the office by appointment um, to take care of whatever their program needs are. We also deliver programs um, using uh, what we call FSA county committees. These committees uh, are made up of farmers. There's one pretty much in each county, uh, and they help us administer these programs by putting um, local information uh, at our in our hands. So basically, you know, if we have a if we have a hurricane that should pass by and do some crop damage, we really need farmers to help us understand what the impact is. You know, maybe the impact is um, right now with all this wet weather, uh, potatoes are more affected maybe than some other crop um, that's at a different stage in its growing season. And so these farmer committees um, help us administer these programs by providing local um, hands-on experience about the crops and livestock and the types of agriculture going on um, in a community. And so uh, those county committees are elected by farmers. And so we're coming up on our election cycle and uh, throughout the country we'll be um, electing county committee members uh, to our local county committees. The next slide, please. Okay, so for more information um, and all of these programs and uh, fact sheets, more information about the programs is available on our agency website, fsa.usda.gov. Farmers.gov is a relatively new website that has a wealth of information about all kinds of USDA programs, including disaster programs, loan programs, uh, conservation programs for all USDA agencies. And then there's even a website that's targeted to new farmers. And so uh, beginning farmers should check out newfarmers.usda.gov. So thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be part of this um, and talk about the resources that we have available in Delaware. Thank you, Robin. And it's pretty astounding that to date, your agency has invested more in rural America this past year than ever. A real testimony, not only to the staff, but certainly to the need for those programs. So hats off to you guys for that. So next is our, our next sister agency that we call them, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we are delighted that the state conservationist could join us, Ms. Casey Taylor. And she's responsible for a little different side of the production agriculture. They're more conservation planning and those type of activities and farm bill delivery and implementation. So Casey, the floor is yours, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Anne, for the very warm welcome. And good morning, all. Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you today and to be able to engage in a deeper dive and focused conversation about the Natural Resources Conservation Service, as well as now making sure that we can start looking at our next steps and beyond. But before we get I did want to really acknowledge the tremendous work and insight that has been led by our own Denise Lovelady and Chandra Owens with being able to bring us together to, in this summit to help us have an engaged, focused discussion for community prosperity here in the state and beyond. Next slide, please. So who are we? Uh, I, I'm always a firm believer that in order for you to, to know about where we're going, we have to talk a little bit about where we've been. So in 1933, the Soil Erosion Service with, that we were previously named uh, was founded under the Department of the Interior. This was founded to help educate and support our producers with soil saving methodologies to combat one of the worst natural disasters of our time, the Dust Bowl. In 1935, our name changed and we moved to the Department of Agriculture and we were then named the Soil Conservation Service. Our focus was expanded, so we weren't solely looking at soil erosion, but now we also address soil erosion as well as now water erosion and water conservation needs. In 1994, we changed our name one final time to our present name, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, to address the critical resource concerns that now have expanded across the landscape. That now is going to encompass the totality of resource concerns across the, the US. Soil, water, air, plants, animals, plus the human impact, as well as now concerns. Next slide, please. So in order for us to ensure that we're achieving those objectives that we, we titled within the SWAPA plus H model, 
we really wanted to make sure that our vision and mission statement is truly aligning with the totality needs that have been identified within our discussion for our core conservation partnership. To help us make sure that that part was now emphasized and more clear, we have gone in and unveiled our new mission and vision statement. We now see that these mission and vision statements will better align within our agency's culture, as well as now helping to epitomize the exemplary work that is being completed and performed by our technical staff. We're seeing this as part of a broader effort to strategically guide the investment of our agency resources to help our producers and growers meet the challenging needs of agriculture and to protect the natural resources for the future. The new mission and vision statements will more accurately reflect who we are, what we do, and why this critical work is so important, not only to the nation's producers, but will also ensure that we're continuing to help the people help the land. Next slide, please. So looking at our core conservation partnership, one of those critical partners are our conservation districts. And giving you a little bit of history about that. In 1937, the first county conservation district was formed to link both the federal agency as well as now our local producers and growers. Through the grassroots leadership, a conservation effort was launched with, which established nearly 3,000 conservation districts, which will also encompass our own Delaware Association of Conservation Districts here in the first state. The partnership between NRCS and the conservation districts is one that was carefully designed. This unique and productive working relationship continues to be the model that is now providing federal resources at the local level through a locally led grassroots effort. The formation of NRCS and our conservation districts recognize that conservation was and continues to be a problem that is shared both by the public as well as now across society. Solving those critical problems and concerns was often beyond the means of our single landowner and that farmer. As a result, we wanted to be able to have a collaborative, cooperative public support. And this is where our districts really helped us to bring voice and light to those concerns, as well as now ensuring that we have a path going forward. The partnership of the conservation districts and NRCS is a way for us to continue to identify and resolve those concerns and questions. Next slide, please. So as we're looking at this, it's been so great to be a part of this conversation thus far because, again, we've been able to talk about that collaborative conservation partnership. One thing that we really wanted to do in that partnership, not only here in Delaware, but then looking at us across the U.S., was really to go in and to define our scope of who we are, what we're doing, and how will we be able to engage our public in a more concise fashion. So I want to break that down in our five Ps. That's going, to, that's going to encompass our people, our programs, our policies and processes, partners, and then finally, our philosophy. So starting first with our people. We wanted to make an investment to ensure that our technically trained staff is able to be able to go out and to work with the public to help identify, prescribe, and provide real-time scientific-based resource needs and uh, conservation practices to address those critical key, uh, resource concerns. Our program. In an effort to improve the program delivery, we're looking at going in and having increased conversations and dialogue and making sure that we have a continual discussion for ways that will become more efficient, what is now going to be the better process, and more specifically, what is going to help our producers be able to move forward with addressing those critical resource concerns. We also see this being critical to ensure that we have an expansion of voluntary conservation here in the first state and beyond. Our policies and processes. We have and will continue to streamline the internal policies and processes as well as now providing innovative technical assistance as well as now guidance moving forward. Our partner, as you saw on the prior slide and demonstrated by the panel today, we're looking at harnessing the power of the partnership being able to leverage funding, ensuring that now we have an optimized group where now this group of technical leaders, administrative experts will help us go in and to expand voluntary conservation, not only in the first state, across the Eastern Shore and beyond. And finally, looking at our philosophy. 
being responsive and prepared to help address the future changes in agriculture and conservation to increase voluntary conservation in the state and beyond. Next slide, please. We do this to ensure that we're helping to support all of our producers and growers across the state of Delaware and beyond. What you're gonna see on the slide now are a breakdown of who we get to work with and who we're very advanced uh, who we're very excited to be able to implement not only the 2018 Farm Bill, prior year Farm Bills, and then beyond. So as we're coming to the closeout of our first full year of implementation under the 2018 Farm Bill, we are very proud to have delivered and funded in excess of $10 million to support voluntary conservation here in the first state alone. The funds have been prioritized again through the local working group process and then moved up to our state technical committee to ensure that we now have truly identified and prioritized those critical concerns and are, and are able to see a sustainable difference moving forward. In order to do this, we wanted to ensure that again, like is competing with like, and so we're not at a time where now either a beginning farmer is now trying to compete with a traditional farmer. Our national office has set up specific mandates to ensure that we have a balance of funding to ensure that, again, we have equal representation across our programs. What we're looking at is that there's 10% of the funds that have been designated for wildlife, 50% of the funds have been allocated for our, our livestock producers. You will see that as a change from our prior farm bill in 2014, where that was up to 60%. So 50% has been designated now for 2018 and that farm bill cycle timeline of five years. And then also the remaining 50% will be for additional prioritized resource concerns across the state. 5% of the available funds will now be for beginning farmers and then another 5% for our socially disadvantaged farmers. Here in Delaware, what we have been able to do through those conversations with our local work group as well as in our state technical committee is been able to now have one, an expanded technical and financial assistance that's been provided to our livestock producers because we know that that is one of our larger industries here in the state. In addition to this, we now ensure that not only will the livestock producers as well as our traditional producers outside of livestock be able to receive that assistance, but we're also now ensuring that we increase the funding that is going above and beyond what those markers that have been set for our beginning farmers and socially disadvantaged producers. So we're very proud of that and we look forward to more conversations yet to come for opportunities to expand that delivery going into 2021. Next slide. Continue to look at helping people help the land. One thing that we really wanted to do today was to give you a quick overview of our working lands programs, as well as now versus our easement programs. What you're gonna to see today on the slide will for three examples of our working lands programs here in the state. So why focus on the working lands program? We thought that this would allow for a quick engagement to do an overview and an introduction for ways to improve the current agriculture base, but then still being able to maintain and farm your acres accordingly. One thing that we are so excited to do above and beyond our working lands pro pro uh, program is to partner in with Delaware Department of Agriculture for our agriculture easement program. As that partnership continues to grow and expand, we have increased to an access of $20 million that is being moved forward to secure long-term easements here in the state to ensure that we have a strong, viable farming agriculture in Delaware. So thank you so much for that, Kenny and Secretary Skews. We look forward to that continued collaboration to come. But for the working land programs that you see here on the slide, we are very excited for that whether it's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the Conservation Stewardship Program, or the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, these programs are now truly engaged to ensure that voluntary conservation is premier and that we are providing real-time solutions and innovations to be able to leverage funding, provide that technical assistance, identify those critical resource concerns, and be able to have an optimal product as well as now sustainability and increase viability for our producers here in the state. Next slide. So how do we get started? One thing that we always wanna do is to start first with going in and doing a detailed conservation plan and resource assessment. 
We do this in we do this working specifically with our producers to ensure that now we have first remedied and identified what those concerns are. From there, if we now see that the producer has a desire to move forward within financial assistance, whether if it's through a working lands program or looking at an easement where they can retire acres or protect those acres moving forward, we really want to ensure that we have a good path forward for them. From there, we'll move through within our eligibility, ranking, and batching periods. And it's critical to note that we have continuous signups moving throughout our, cons our conservation program throughout the year. There will be specific batching periods, and we are now closing out our final batching period and ranking application for the, for the Environmental Quality Incentive Program EQIP that you saw on the prior slide. Uh, in that piece for the EQIP program alone, we were looking at about 6.8 million. Of that, we are able now through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program to have those funds expanded out and we've been able to have in access of $11 million moving throughout the state to ensure that we're able to address those prioritized concerns through the local work group process. From there, we move forward into the ranking, and if the participant is selected, then we will move forward with getting a contract signed and secured, and then moving forward within that practice implementation for increased sustainability for years and years to come. Next slide. Thank you. So how do we move forward? How do we contact each other? What you're gonna see, and very similar to what Robin shared with you, we do and have established our, our, our service centers or those technical offices across the state. And we are located in four offices here in Delaware, very similar again to our sister agencies, both Rural Development and Farm Service Agency. We have offices in Newcastle, we have them here in Kent County, as well as now in Sussex County. Our flagship office or our state office is here in Dover, and that information that you're seeing on the screen will allow you to reach out and to contact us for specific questions that you may have above and beyond being able now to go into the website and contacting our district conservationists within the respective offices. Thank you guys so very much for your time, for your attention. We look forward to working with you, having expanded conversations, and looking forward to making sure that we're all helping people help the land. Take care. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you, Ann. Thank you so much, Casey. And if our audience did not know prior to this morning the impact of all the USDA programs on their lives in particular and how much that touches them, they certainly know now. And our next sister agency is one that certainly impacts all of us, and that is the Food and Nutrition Service. Again, it seems like all of our agencies have been kind of shot out of the ballpark in, in recent months and that with activities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are pleased that Diana Limbacher could join us this morning. Diana has long been a partner of, uh, of our USDA state fact committees. She's our deputy regional administrator for the Mid-Atlantic region. So she has a wide footprint as many of us do. And they have over 15 different uh, nutrition programs that, that we all certainly benefit from. So Diana, we're pleased that you could join us this morning and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ann. Always nice to see you. Uh, I did wanna start off just by saying how pleased I am to be a part of the summit. Um, similar to Denise, we first met Mike Beatty in Philadelphia um, and started our partnership there. Um, and I did wanna just um, give a big thank you to our USDA partners, um, Denise from Rural Development and Casey, um, the state conservationist from whom we just heard. And then we also at USDA deal with um, many other state agencies to implement our programs. We're a little bit different from our USDA partners in Delaware, Maryland, in that we cover eight state agencies. And we cover um, Delaware, DC, Maryland, New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Virginia, and West Virginia. We used to have Virgin Islands in the region, but now we had a, a realignment and that's with our Northeast region. So a little different from our sister agencies is we don't provide direct services for many of our programs. We work through participating state agencies. Um, like for instance, we work through Delaware um, 
Secretary of Agriculture with Secretary Skews in terms of implementing the farmers program. So, and we work with education and human resources and so forth in the different programs. So I just wanted to start off by giving you, uh, next slide please, um, a little bit of background on our um, food and nutrition services. As Ann said, we do have 15 different programs. Um, the 15 different programs basically for, um, serve one in four Americans. You know, as I said, one in four Americans participate in at least one of these programs. And I did want to um, just start off by telling you a little bit about our FNS mission, because what we want to do is we want to increase food insecurity, we want to reduce hunger, and then we provide children and low-income individuals access to food, a healthful diet, nutrition education, and then we're doing this by supporting agriculture and we're hopefully inspiring public confidence. When in looking at our programs, how we administer them when we're not in a disaster situation, we're very tied into disasters, you know, at especially COVID-19 and getting food to the one in four Americans who use our programs. So I'm going to talk about our programs, how they're normally um, administered, but know that our programs are very responsive and naturally we have to um, look for waivers and flexibilities to deliver the programs during disasters and um, COVID-19. But wanted to first talk about our child nutrition programs and they are concentrated on giving healthy foods to children. And they're our national school lunch program, our school breakfast program, our child and adult care feed product, feed, feeding program, and also our summer food service program. And we also have a fresh fruit and vegetable program. And these programs um, basically serve about 30 million children a day. And so during COVID-19, uh, we are looking at all different flexibilities and um, waivers, as I mentioned before, so that we're able to administer the programs and get the food to the children sort of outside of our normal regulatory process. Um, we also have the, the WIC program for pregnant women, infants, and children, which is one of our extremely successful programs. Um, and in, tied into the WIC program, we have the WIC um, Farmers Market Nutrition Program, and I'll be talking about these a little bit later, and the WIC Seniors Farmers Market Nutrition Program. Our largest program is our SNAP program, our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, that was formerly the Food Stamp Program. And basically that program is about a $60 billion program serving 35 million uh, individuals throughout the United States. Uh, we, our program benefits have increased naturally during the COVID-19 situation. So our, the funding that we normally have is a little bit higher now because we do have to be flexible to the environment because we are the safety net. And then we, we have to be able to um, sort of ebb and flow so that when there's greater need, our programs step forward and provide additional services. In terms of the SNAP program though, we do have um, individuals receive an EBT card and they go into food retailers. There's about 250,000 of them throughout the country. And then they also redeem their benefits at farmer's markets, nutrition programs, um, and the farmer's market programs where they're determined eligible for the program. Um, I did wanna to mention too, we also have, which is very pivotal, in terms of um, our, during a disaster, we have our FNS food distribution programs. And where what we do there is we distribute um, USDA purchased food to school children and low income families. Um, it's done that for children, it's done through the schools. And then we also have emergency um, feeding programs where we provide um, foods during disasters. And we also provide TFAP foods to food banks. And then we also have our um, food distribution programs on Indian reservations. So the purchasing of the food distribution foods that go into these programs, you know, we look at FNS to really stabilize prices in agriculture and to create a balance in terms of supply and demand. So if I can have the next slide, please. In terms of that, you can 
again, okay. in terms of SNS priorities, we have three main priorities that Secretary Purdue has basically challenged us to implement. One is self-sufficiency. We have, and I'll be talking about them a little bit later, initiatives where we want to help American citizens become economically secure so that they can support themselves and their families. And we have many initiatives that are geared to self-sufficiency. One of our primary tools is our SNAP E&T program that I'll be addressing. Another high priority for FNS is we want to ensure the integrity of our program. Um, you know, it fluctuates from year to year depending on the economy, and that's how our programs are, are meant to operate. But we, we have about $80 billion in terms of these programs um, that's distributed to, um, our Amer to, the, uh, to American citizens. So we want to ensure the integrity of the program so that there is public confidence and they're supported by Congress. And then the third priority we have is just better customer service. We want better customer service to our clients, to our state agencies, to our sister agencies, and to our partners. Next slide, please. You know, as I mentioned, um, I'm going to focus today's conversation on SNAP-Ed, which is as part of the SNAP program, there's an education component, and there's about $441 million available to states throughout the nation. And those programs are very important in terms of, you know, educating Americans in, uh, and our community partners in a various different ways by having these monies available. And then it's our SNAP farmers markets. And then also, as I said, our, through the WIC pro program, it's the seniors farmers market program and um, the WIC farmers market program. And for those programs, especially with um, the WIC program, we work through um, the Delaware um, State Secretary of Agriculture. Next slide, please. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about SNAP in Delaware. In um, overall, nationally, our um, SNAP program reaches, as I said, about 35, 36, million people each month. Uh, and that's what in a regular year. This year with COVID-19, um, we don't have those numbers yet, but we expect that it will be higher. And um, the, the benefits are issued through an EBT card. So they have almost like a credit card where they go into the um, farmer's markets and also the 250,000 retail stores and they, and they basically redeem the benefits. And then we also have, um, in Delaware, it averages about 120,000 De uh, Delaware residents each month. And during FY 2019, as I said, for 2020, it's probably going to be a little higher. There was over $178 million issued in Delaware. And then the average benefit is, a, is about 15 million per month. Next slide, please. Um, the next couple slides, I do want to talk about SNAP Farmers Markets. Um, this is a program that um, we really are trying to encourage. In terms of the farmers markets, um, you know, we do work with our sister agencies and they've been very helpful in helping us get the, the word out about the SNAP program. But there's a lot of opportunity there for farmers markets and a lot of money that could help them economically. So it is a program that we are you know, trying to um, promote. So if I can have the next slide. In FY um, 2019, and as, as we know, 2020 is going to be a little bit differently. We had about 82% of SNAP benefits that were redeemed in supermarkets and, and superstores, as I mentioned earlier. But we did have about 3,600 direct farmers markets and, um, and farm stands participating nationwide to accept SNAP. And then um, for the SNAP benefits, um, there was only, uh, only about 0.05% of SNAP benefits redeemed at the farmer's market and the direct marketing farmers. So as I said, it is an area where we have a lot of opportunity. Um, and have, as I said, we've worked with our sister agencies and certainly want to reach out to, to the community 
so that we're, we will be able to redeem um, more SNAP benefits at farmer's markets. Next slide, please. In Delaware, um, we basically have eight authorized farmers markets and then seven authorized um, direct marketing farmers. And you could see the monies that have been redeemed, um, you know, both in um, you know, Delaware and Virginia, we, we have that put together. Next slide, please. In terms of um, getting authorized for the SNAP program, if you are a, um, for individuals, we have the website there and we'll have more information at the end and there's application guidance. And usually it takes like up to 30 or 45 days once your application goes in for a farmer to be, or a farm stand to be authorized. And we do have free EBT equipment because it's a little bit more complicated at the farmer's markets, um, you know, because they need equipment in order to be able to swipe the EBT card but we do have many options available in various locations and the equipment is free to new farmers. Next slide, please. Um, I am gonna talk a little bit about SNAP employment and training because this is an extremely high priority for FNS. Um, it's, been, it's been for the last decade, but in particular, um, we have really been stressing the importance of um, you know, training for our SNAP participants and helping them to become self-sufficient. So if I could have the next slide, please. In terms of our SNAP ENT programs, the state agencies administer them and it is set up so that participants will be able to enroll in programs to increase their skills, gain work experience, and then just obtain uh, regular employment. Um, it, the ENT, there's money provided um, to state agencies, and I'll talk a little bit more about Delaware. But as I said, this is something that we've been trying to push, um, as I said, the last decade, and and considerably more in the in the next um, in the last couple of years. And we will be in the remainder of um, 2020, and then through 2021 as well. Next slide, please. In terms of um, our areas of focus for SNAP ENT, as I said, we're really trying to expand employment and training opportunities and access to ENT services. Um, there has been certain state agencies have done a better job than others in terms of implementing and expanding ENT, but we've been working with um, the State Department of Human Resources and Social Services to really tried to get more third party partners involved to improve the management oversight and to um, really enforce the policy and compliance with the ENT programs. Next slide, please. You know, in Delaware, um, they have done a really good job in terms of ENT. And as part of the 2014 Farm Bill, they became what's called a pilot site and they had a wonder project and that went from April 2015 to June 2019 and we were pleased with the efforts of the projects. Um, Department of Health and Social Services, especially starting in FY19, um, has really tried to expand the programs, um, you know, especially with regard to the pilot program. Um, there's a lot more work that we could do, but we're pleased with where Delaware is going. But we, um, but we are always asking for our, our sister agencies, for the state agencies and the cabinet officials to really help us get um, the ENT programs going and help individuals become self-sufficient. Um, in Delaware specifically, the Department of Health and Social Services is targeting what we refer to as able-bodied body adults without dependents um, as an area for these individuals really can benefit from training and expanded skill development and um, in order to become economically self-sufficient. And we were really pleased to see that Department of Health and Human Services in Delaware were able to 
um, on board additional ANT third party partners because we need the third party partners, whether it's food banks or, um, or ministries, um, colleges and universities where they can offer programs, whether they're in the culinary arts or they could be the machinist, all different programs, nursing assistance, in order to provide opportunities for our SNAP participants to become self-sufficient. So as I said, we've been pushing um, a and throughout the last decade, but really we're, we're going to be working with um, all the state agencies to see where the avenues are and what we can do to promote employment and training of our SNAP participants. Next slide, please. Um, another area for us that with regard to FNS that ties on the SNAP program is with regard to our um, nutrition education and obesity prevention grants. And this basically became available through the um, Healthy Hunger, Hunger Free Kids Act uh, back in 2010. And you know, as I said, we have $441 million available and state agencies receive, uh, apply for and receive grant money. Um, and we have different state agencies and there's implementing agencies that work to basically improve nutrition education through schools, through communities and so forth. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the goal and goal and focus and, and strategic initiatives with regard to SNAP, um, and again, SNAP is the, the, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and education is an ask the SNAP Ed, as we call it, is within that. Um, and what we're trying to do is help participants, citizens, American citizens make healthy food choices and also choose active lifestyles. And in order to do this, that $441 million is really spent on health promotion and, um, and prevention to prevent individuals from um, the onset of diseases by becoming healthier. And there are a number of studies and approaches that are used that we share across uh, the state agencies so that they can implement goals and strategies to make a difference in the lives of Americans. Because the, if the healthier Americans are, you know, over in general, the less we're going to spend on, um, on healthcare cost. And the more, uh, and it does tie into also the self-sufficiency as well. Next slide, slide please. Just wanted to give you a little bit of information about the Delaware SNAP-Ed program. Um, and again, you'd be able to contact them and find out more information. The state agency um, that who administers the programs, because as I said, in FNS, we work through state partners and we do have the eight states, uh, but in Delaware, it's Division of Social Services, Department of Health and Social Services. And then we, they partner, the state agency, partners with an implementing agency. And in this case, it's the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension Service. And the contractors are the, um, the Delaware State University and also um, the Food Bank of Delaware. So, you know, as you've been hearing from a lot of our other partners, especially at FNS, in terms of implementing our programs and affecting positive outcomes, we have to walk, we work through uh, many different state partners. So for us, you know, even to administer our programs, we're working through departments of education. As I said, the Department of Social Services or the equivalent in other state agencies, Department of Agriculture, um, Department of Aging. So we partner with the agencies, we provide funding, and then we, um, we implement the programs and then, um, you know, work with them to share best practices and to affect positive outcomes. Next slide, please. In terms of the SNAP education in Delaware, um, you know, as I said before, we are aiming, targeting schools, the summer programs, um, community and senior centers, centers, barbers markets, and food pantries. And so what the, the money's going into these programs is they're trying to provide, and they've been very successful in targeting um, education to be provided in all these different settings. There's also part of SNAP-Ed, it's called Policy Systems and Environmental Strategies. 
And this ties into training our community partners. And again, um, it's a holistic approach in terms of SNAP-Ed. We're working directly with schools, we're working with community partners, summer programs, senior centers, all sorts of partners to administer the program and make a difference in terms of having um, SNAP participants eat healthier. And then um, just for a frame of reference in Delaware, it reaches over 10,000, it reached over 10,000 Delawareans in 2019. Naturally, in terms of um, what we're doing in 2020, um, we're trying to look at remote learning and remote coordination. And we know that for COVID-19, you know, for this year and however long it, it lasts, um, you know, we are trying to normalize and get back to our normal operations. Um, and I know, um, for instance, even with the farmer's market, um, Ken Bounds was talking about Delaware and what they've been doing. So not only Delaware, but all the state agencies, you know, we're trying to return to normal, but we're doing our best um, in terms of working with the state agencies to deliver services the best way we can, you know, during these times until we, we do go back to our programs as they are, as they're usually administered. And I just want to, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you in the next page. Um, it has our contact individuals. And as I said, for, um, for us, we work through all different agencies. So um, hopefully we'll, and you'll be sharing these slides and all this contact information. So I won't go over um, all of it, but as Ann said in the beginning with regard to the FNS programs, we really reach many different agencies and because we have 15 different programs. So, you know, there's different aspects that we're sharing. Now, this is just a piece of it that we think you are going to be interested in today in terms of um, with regard to Delaware. But again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Diana. And I'm sure all of you picked up on how many times she said the word partner. And that is the true meaning of our food nutrition, food nutrition service programs, like all the USDA agencies and how we accomplish all that we do with our, our great team of partners. So again, thank you, Diana, and thanks to the folks at Food Nutrition for keeping all of us just so maybe a little bit healthier and more aware of, of our food. So folks, we are uh, running a, a bit behind, uh, or ma maybe it's even ahead because we have such great information. So we are at kind of a break in our agenda, not really a, a, a break in, in the platform, we have a couple things that we want to engage right now. First is a poll that Chandra's going to do, and then we'll be glad to take some question and answer. So now would be a time if you have a direct question for one of the speakers that has already gone, if you place that in the chat, or you're welcome to raise your elect electronic hand and you'll be uh, called on and we'll mute you. Uh, we have planned for 10 minutes, but we'll cut that back to five to see if we can make up a just a little bit of time. So now's your opportunity. And just a reminder, as Diana said, you will be getting a copy of this, of the presentation, as well as all the links and all that good info. So much information can flow after, to, after this morning. So uh, there your uh, poll should be on your screen. So if you'd like to go ahead and indicate which state you're calling from. Looks like we are heavy on on Delaware so far. We have Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Virginia, and New York even, and, and some other. I'm in Virginia, I'm not sure we mentioned that, but. And for so those who are from other, you can type in the chat box, which state you're calling from. And those yeah. who do have questions, you can go ahead and ask them or type them in the chat box and we'll address those too but thank you for being here. So my clock says 1139, so at 1144, we will proceed back to the normal program. Um, but if we don't have enough questions to fill us up till then, we will keep rolling. So now's a good time for a stretch break. If you need to do any of that, we have, um, Georgia is from Texas, wow. And Carla is from Georgia, the former USDA liaison in Delaware. How about that? 
I'll read. We did have one question earlier that uh, Denise has already answered, and that was regarding the Rural Development Community Facility Grant Program. Could that be used for the educational learning hubs? And the shorter answer would be yes, if the applicant is a public body, nonprofit, or federally recognized Indian tribe. And uh, of course, Rural Development would welcome the opportunity to discuss that further with you af after today. Wow, we have Illinois joining us. That's fabulous. So any questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat. Chandra, did you have another polling question or just the one? The next polling question will be asked at the end. In gotcha. the mm -hmm. Okie doke. Well, folks, you can see the the results there from the poll, overwhelming response from Delaware, which is no surprise for that, but, but it's great to have our neighbors and friends from other areas. So again, together, all of us learn that much more. Another Texas. Mississippi. We're running the full gambit this morning, aren't we? That's wonderful. Well, folks, we're not seeing any. Oh, Kentucky now. If you have questions, please go ahead and, and put them in the chat. We have Louisiana. Here's a question. Have you been helping farmers across, across the country as a result of COVID-19? If so, how? So we'll let FSA and NRCS handle that one. I can answer from the rural development perspective with our Business and Industry Cares Act uh, program that, that Denise mentioned for the first time ever that, that funding is, is available to an agricultural producer that is not eligible for similar type financing through the Farm Service Agency. So that's one way that rural development has able, been able to step into that. So FSA or NRCS, if you wanna expand on that, feel free. Hey, Ann, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, thank you. Okay, excellent. Well, just to give a quick overview of some of the assistance that has been provided, uh, I know this was, I think Kenny brought this up in, our, in the uh, preliminary comments. Uh, we too now have been working with our State Departments of Ag and making sure that when those homes, or excuse me, when the producers now were impacted with depopulations, we were able to provide both technical assistance and designs as well as now financial assistance working back with those producers to ensure that we're able to move them forward for any of those concerns that they've had. We're fortunate that this hasn't been widespread. And as Kenny has already indicated here in the first state, uh, as we've worked with that integrator and then working with uh, Chris Brosh and his team, uh, that grower, that integrator, they were very responsive and timely, and they've been able to move forward accordingly. Now they did coordinate and work back through our conservation partnership. We're now working with Chris and his team through the nutrient management portion of DDA, Delaware Department of Agriculture, as well as now working back with NRCS to ensure that nothing was moved outside of those houses and then moved into the sheds before now it truly had composted and moved forward. So long story short, we were there on site to ensure that if there were concerns for shortages, slippages, NRCS now could provide both financial assistance, technical assistance through emergency funding, through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP, to help move those items forward. Um, did, uh, I, I'm sorry. One other item that I did want to share with you, and it kind of follows up to what Robin was sharing, we have and continue to provide that technical assistance regardless as to whether uh, we have a full staff in or not within our respective offices. What we've tried to do, again, was to make sure that we're working with our producers to see what is the best way to, con to contact, support, and to provide that assistance that they need. So whether that's in person and we're socially distanced, or now whether we are working on the line, working online, or again, working on the phone. All of this now has been in tandem through the leadership of our customers to make sure it makes sense and it's keeping them safe, as well as now our employees healthy and viable to provide that support. So any questions that you guys have, maybe going into specifics, please feel free to shoot that into Anne 
or you can reach me offline by calling our main line number and we'll make sure that we can get those questions addressed for you. Thank you, Ann. Turn it back to you, ma'am. Thank you, Casey. Appreciate that. We have um, another question in the chat for uh, food nutrition. So Maria uh, or Diana, I'm sorry, if you could maybe address that one in, in the chat box there and we will move on with the program since we are, are past our five minute mark just to keep us rolling. So next we segue into the um, part of the agenda called additional federal support. There are many other federal agencies besides what we know it from USDA. And next we have the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We have Region 3 Regional Director Matthew Baker, who uh, has been around since uh, 2018 in his current position. So Mr. Baker, uh, if you'll take it away, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you so much. And let me remind our speakers, Chandra is uh, waving colored slides at you. If, if your time is, is running uh, with low caution lights, red, green, and, and yellow. So if you wanna be sure to place her in your view shed, in case you, um, you begin to run over, she'll give you the little heads up for that. So the little thank housekeeping, you. thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ann. Can you hear me all right? You're great, thanks so much. Great, thank you so much for inviting me and for the informative program. I've le really learned a lot through USDA and, and it's a, a great honor to join my federal and state colleagues uh, this morning uh, to bring greetings in behalf of US Secretary Alex Azar and US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we, uh, uh, we do a lot within uh, HHS and we love to partner with USDA uh, when we can. And as a former 13 term member of the House of Representatives, Speaker Pro Tem and Health uh, Chairman, uh, I, I gotta tell you, USDA has always been one of my favorite uh, federal uh, departments uh, to work with. In fact, uh, I met Kenny Bounds many years ago in, in the Pennsylvania legislature. I don't know if he remembers me, but I remember him and glad to see he's, he's still at it and being so productive and bringing all his experience uh, uh, to the fore. Uh, I do want to uh, just to, to let you know that I'm the regional director for region three representing Delaware uh, DC, District of Columbia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. And uh, I've had an opportunity to travel extensively through Maryland and, and Delaware, uh, and I've gotten to know your, your great states there. Um, one of the things that I am asked to do is to advise the HHS on state, local, and tribal issues regarding HHS policies and programs. You can move to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I also am involved in facilitating communication between HHS and state, local, and tribal governments. I represent the Secretary, Deputy Secretary, and communications with governmental officials and other federal agencies, officials of state, tribal, and local governments, as well as advocacy groups. Uh, and I act as a liaison with uh, uh, the various departments. And uh, in fact, this morning, uh, I communicated with all the governor's offices about the delivery of remdesivir, which is a therapeutic regarding uh, the treatment for COVID. Um, this is an organizational chart that's before you, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, uh, but, but basically, if, if, if you look at that chart, uh, if you could go back there, it, it represents 80,000 people that work within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And um, it also represents the largest federal budget in America. It's, uh, it's about a $1.3 trillion budget, uh, thanks to Congress. Uh, although HHS had the lead with COVID funding that Congress has allocated, we have uh, sent out trillions of dollars across the country to address the pandemic. Uh, and HHS has had the lead uh, FEMA has also been very, very instrumental, as has the Department of Defense. But it does surprise a lot of people to hear that HHS has a larger budget than the U.S. military. Uh, 
and it has hundreds of programs that it's involved in. We don't have time to go through all those programs, but some of the some of the more familiar programs uh, that you've heard a lot about lately uh, is um, FDA, uh, CDC, uh, NIH, um, and uh, of course HRSA and and SAMHSA. We also have a a smaller department, uh, but a very important one that a lot of people aren't aware of, and that's the Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. And this is, just gives you a snapshot of some of the uh, uh, operational divisions that we have. Uh, embedded in those are many, many programs. Uh, and uh, so we, we are happy to work with our federally recognized tribes. We have in Region 3, uh, seven federally recognized tribes, all located within the state of Virginia. There are many other tribes, but they're not federally recognized. So it is our duty and obligation to work with uh, our federally recognized tribes. Next slide. So uh, pre-COVID-19, our top priorities for HHS uh, Secretary Azar identified four priorities uh, to focus the department's work to improve the health and well-being of the American people, ending the crisis of opioid addiction and overdose, improve the availability and affordability of health insurance, lowering the cost of prescription drugs for all Americans without discouraging innovation, and transforming our system to one that, that pays for value rather than volume. Next slide. We approached uh, combating the opioid crisis in a five-point strategy, prevention, treatment, recovery, better data, better pain management. Next, next slide. And this just gives you some information, a snapshot in time uh, between 2016 and 2019. Again, this data is all pre-COVID-19. Obviously, uh, a lot of data that comes in uh, is uh, we have to look back in time and it shows you uh, just uh, in addressing the opioid epidemic. We expended over $9 billion in grants from HHS uh, to support our states, tribes, and local communities. Um, there's about 14,000 substance abuse facilities in the United States and about 1.3 million Americans are receiving MAT, medication assisted treatment. Uh, and at that point in time, between 2017 and 2018, uh, we were seeing some progress. Um, uh, we were seeing a decline in drug overdose deaths in the United States. Uh, and we were seeing a, which is a good thing, 106% increase in waived uh, data wave provider and uh, really 142% increase in medication assisted treatment patients. So that, that was a great improvement. Next slide. So uh, this is one of the, the top priorities and you're probably going to be hearing more uh, about this. Uh, uh, President Trump signed four executive actions to instruct HHS Secretary Azar, and uh, this gives you a uh, perspective on trying to lower costs and providing uh, more access to medications um, and uh, ending this shadowy system of kickbacks by middlemen that lurks behind the high out of cost pocket costs at the pharmacy counter. Seniors will uh, directly receive discounts in the Medicare Part D program, totaling more than $30 billion. That's an average discount savings of 26 to 30%. And if you haven't guessed by now, one of the, the biggest programs that we have in HHS uh, funds uh, goes through Medicare and Medicaid. Um, I'm seeing a green slide. Thank you for that. Um, let's go to the next slide. We're going to keep this moving. 
uh, I really wanted to talk about this because this, this is something recent that's just happened through HHS on August 3rd. President Trump signed an executive order requesting HHS produce a report on existing upcoming efforts to improve rural health care. And the action plan provides a roadmap for HHS to strengthen departmental coordination to better serve the millions of, of Americans who live in rural communities across uh, America. It's our understanding there's about 57 million Americans who live in rural communities. So 18 HHS agencies and offices took part in developing the plan, which includes 71 new or expanded activities for fiscal year 2020 and beyond. And just a couple of days ago, HHS released our action plan. Efforts will be undertaken by uh, HHS. Uh, will include nine rural focused administrative or regulatory actions, three new rural focused technical efforts, and 14 new rural research efforts and five new rural program efforts. Next slide. And this, this is, uh, uh, the plan lays out a four point strategy to transform rural health and human services. And so uh, it essentially, we want to build a sustainable health and human services model for rural communities by empowering rural providers to transform service delivery on a broad scale. We want to leverage technology and innovation to deliver quality care and services to rural communities more efficiently and cost effectively. And we want to focus on preventing disease and mortality by developing rural specific efforts to improve health outcomes and lastly, increase rural access to care by eliminating regulatory burdens that limit the availability of needed clinical professions. And I, I heard Kenny uh, mention several issues and I really appreciated his shout out for our CDC department coming alongside Delaware, uh, especially with the outbreak of the, uh, the poultry industry and what needed to be done. I know we had, we dispatched uh, uh, CDC teams. We're working uh, assiduously on our vaccines and therapeutics, which we hope to see some great uh, results here by the end of the year. We're uh, continuously working on uh, alongside USDA and others for support of the broadband telehealth telemedicine programs. And uh, uh, so a lot of different aspects of HHS working alongside our, our brother and sister agencies, both at the federal and the state level. Next slide. And that's it. How'd I do for time? All right, thumbs up. Thank you very much. And Anne, I, I didn't escape my view of that beautiful necklace that you have on. Very appropriate for oh, USDA. Show everybody <laughs> that that is wonderful. Thank you. That that's my trademark. I have one of the the largest non um, living cow collections I think in the world, perhaps. So anytime I can find a new one, so that's but pretty appropriate considering the the line of work. So. We certainly thank, thank you, you for, for your remarks and, and that great info. And uh, one thing that particularly caught my interest was that, that new rural health plan. So I, I know we're just beginning to hear about that and we'll certainly roll that into our community prosperity efforts going forward. So thank you. Hey, hey Matt, this is, uh, this is Kenny Bounds. You know why Alex does such a good job, right? He's a good Eastern Shore guy. You're absolutely right. Uh, his, his father, in fact, was... Uh, uh, the president of the medical association, uh, the the uh, at one at one point, and uh, yeah, a lot of roots there in in Maryland. Well, we'll let him be an honorary Delaware citizen. <laughs> Great, good to hear. Good to see you, Kenny. A lot of good works in the, on the Eastern Shore in all three states, I, I do believe, but. Anyway, next, moving right along with our other federal partners, we have the Department of Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD. Haven't even talked about our alphabet soup uh, yet today, but um, HUD is one of those departments that we all think we know so much about and, and end up knowing so little. So 
This morning, we have Joseph D. Felice. He's the Regional Administrator for Region 3 and covers a, a multitude of states, which I'll, I won't steal his thunder and let him share that with you. And uh, Joseph, the floor is yours and take it away and thank you for joining us today. Hey, no problem. Uh, thanks for having me. We really appreciate this. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm Jody Felice, Regional Administrator for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I am Region 3, covering Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and the District of Columbia. I was appointed by President Trump in May of 2017. My goal with coming to HUD was to make ourselves accessible at the ground level. Um, to date, I visited 195 counties uh, throughout this region in a little over three years. And the way that I look at it is it, it's not government's job to dictate to local municipalities how to do their job. Frankly, it's up to local municipalities to dictate to us how to do our jobs better. And I really believe that um, traveled extensively uh, throughout this region, specifically throughout the, the state of Delaware. I drove there last week. Uh, one problem is if you drive from Philadelphia to Salisbury, you literally hit a light every mile. Um, so don't always trust your GPS on traveling down uh, through the Eastern Shore, through Delaware. But I'm um, with a little bit of talk about what HUD does and how we complement um, USDA and some of our other federal partners. So we can, let's start the slides here. Okay. So first off, we're gonna start with um, the secretarial initiatives. HUD has essentially five major programs, uh, which are public housing, uh, multifamily housing, single family housing, fair housing and equal opportunity, and finally uh, community planning and development. But uh, the one that doesn't necessarily fit is Secretary of Priorities promoting, econo promoting economic opportunity. So let's go, this is a picture you'll see with Senator Coons. This is a picture uh, with Mayor Brzezicki in Wilmington where he announced our new Envision Center. Uh, go to the next slide. This is a picture with uh, Scott Turner uh, from the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council and Tony Loudon, who is in charge of uh, the Interagency Council on uh, Reentry. This was taken in Wilmington at Second Chances Farm, uh, which is really covering a myriad of uh, not just HUD programs, but other programs as well. Uh, so next slide. Did we send over, okay. Are we only seeing these slides? Let me just double check on that. Did you get a list of slides? Did you get a list of, uh, I can circle back. I can talk about this. I just wanna make sure that everybody has um, the information that I put forward. Do you have any, do you have any uh, bullet points or no? Was that sent over? You did have that. Yes, I'm yes, just showing the PowerPoint. Oh, perfect. All right, well then let's, then let's circle back then for a second. Gotcha. Um, okay, and one more. All right, so promoting economic opportunity, we'll start there. Uh, so essentially one thing the Secretary Carson, Matt just spoke about it, and, and you guys were speaking about it earlier, but Matt, it was self-sufficiency. One thing we realize is that we can build um, buildings uh, all the time we, for public housing, multifamily housing, but in 40 years, those buildings will deteriorate and we just build new buildings. While it, you know, we are in the business of housing people, I believe we need to be in the business of building people. And that's what Envision Centers and some of these secretarial priorities are all about. Specifically, an Envision Center is a hub where people can get many different services from uh, economic opportunity to educational advancement to character and leadership and health and wellness. It's really the kind of become a one-stop shop, really investing in our people. Because what we've seen specifically throughout this region and frankly in Delaware where there's five housing authorities is extensive waiting list. The mindset is, those people that, do, that, that can benefit from the hand up, let's help them so that we can free up some of the backlog. This was a, an initiative by Secretary Carson. There's, we're approaching 100 Envision Centers in the country. We have, I think, now nine in this region, one in One Stop Shop in Wilmington, Delaware. Next slide. Investing in Opportunity Zones. For, so for those that aren't familiar, the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council uh, through the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act established Opportunity Zones, which essentially is 17 federal agencies and three regional partners working together uh, 
to put development into communities that have received disinvestment for a number of years. So there's many opportunity zones in the state of Delaware. I've toured personally. What you see here is Second Chances Farm. For those unfamiliar with Second Chances Farm, Ajit George, uh, Bian, and, and the, for those that are, don't understand necessarily opportunity zones, these are not a HUD program, but frankly, they are uh, a tax incentive uh, through the Department of Revenue. And what it says is if I have capital gains dollars, I can put money into one of these designated zones through a fund, watch that money grow, but at the same time, you know, help uh, that community as well. Um, what, the, what the 17 federal agencies and three regional partners do is essentially there are 217 federal grants tailored towards these opportunity zones. For example, one of which is a HUD grant for what they call Choice Neighborhoods Planning, Choice, Implement, Choice Neighborhoods Implementation Grants, which if you're in an opera, if you know candidate A is in an opportunity zone and candidate B is in an, is not in an opportunity zone and both apply for the grant, candidate A will get preference points towards those federal grants. There's not just HUD, like I said, there's 217 federal grants. USDA has some grants, EPA, HHS, you name it across the board. If you go to grants.gov, click on click on opportunity zones. Right now, I believe there's 27 live grants with federal preference points to opportunity zones. But what Opportunity Zones are, Second Chances Farm was, a, was an initiative where a, a gentleman took an old blighted building in, in, in North Wilmington and, and transformed it into an indoor urban farm, hiring only ex-offenders and using capital dollars, money that capital gains dollars to, to, to pursue this. Um, it's, they were just at the White House uh, last week. This was a little over a month ago. They received many, many um, national accolades for the work that they're doing. And we're going to keep promoting them. And it's beautiful because it's happening in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And it's really kind of covering all the bases. You have farming, you have reentry, you have economic opportunity, you have blight removal, you name it. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, promoting home ownership. Many of you know that, that HUD, not only we give grants on a regular basis, Habitat for Humanity. This was at a Habitat build in, I think we were outside of Milford, uh, on this one. Uh, some of the things that we do for many that don't know our um, FHA program. So my Philadelphia regional office, our single family unit covers all FHA mortgages from Kentucky to Maine. So they process like 2000 some FHA mortgages a day, a day. Now what people don't realize a lot of time is FHA mortgage. This isn't HUD, insh this isn't HUD giving the money, but what we are doing is we are insuring the loan to the lender. So if someone maybe doesn't have that high level credit score, HUD comes to the lender and essentially says, hey, if you give them the money and they don't pay, we will buy it off you for the cost of the note. Um, so, the, so, the, so what we're trying to do is get more people into home ownership. Um, if for some reason people still default and HUD has to take back that property, we do have one program. It's called the Good Neighbor Next Door program. What that'll do is if you're a, a police officer, um, a, a fireman, an EMT, or a teacher, you can buy any of these HUD homes in designated areas for 50% of the cost. So if, if say, if $100,000 uh, owed on the loan, and you can buy that for $50,000. Only in certain designated areas, that's called the Good Neighbor Next Door program. Let's continue. Enhancing rental assistance. So a lot of people know about uh, when people think of HUD, they think of public housing. Um, and that is obviously a big part of our portfolio. Uh, this is us um, in Southern Delaware. Really, we're right outside of, right outside of, right outside of Lewis, uh, where, where this was taken. Um, and so obviously we have our housing authorities. In Delaware, you have uh, um, Wilmington Housing Authority, Delaware State Housing Authority, Newark, Housing Authority, Dover, and Newcastle. Um, Delaware State covers the balance of state, Kent and Sussex County. Uh, that is what you would think about in the past as public housing, uh, which is um, essentially we give money to the housing authority, they build housing, and then they supplement the rent of the renters in there. There's also multifamily housing, which can essentially be privately owned, where we'll work with them directly or we'll work through the Delaware State Housing Authority um, to give certain supplements towards their rent. We also do section 811 and section 202 for those on, and, and that's the one thing I hate when about government officials, we routinely talk in acronyms and numbers that people don't understand. So I'm gonna explain what those are. Uh, 
Section 811 and Section 202 are housing for the disabled or housing for the elderly. We also do veterans housing. That's some of the stuff that we do, which is different than your standard public housing. Uh, we want to be and we also will give home funds and ESG funds, uh, say again, ESG, emergency solutions grants and home funding to different states to provide essentially other backup rental assistance that may come through the state level. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Reducing homelessness. So for those unfamiliar, so I've kind of talked about our, our housing programs, whether it's through single family housing, multifamily housing, or public housing. We also work through another angle, uh, which is um, our continuum of care. That, see the guy in the middle, uh, the, the African-American man with the nice smile, that's Nate Bynum. Nate Bynum is a resident of uh, Wilmington, Delaware. He is a native of Del Mar, Delaware, where his father was the mayor of Del was the mayor of um, uh, Del Mar. Right behind him is his wife Maria Bynum. Right to the right is Randy Sheets. Why am I pointing all them out to you? Because they are very important people at HUD, and they all live within the state of Delaware. Maria runs our Delaware field office. Uh, Randall Sheets runs uh, our multifamily office, and Nate Bynum runs our community planning and development office. Community development. Community planning and development essentially has two wings. That's the entitlement grant funding and the continuum of care funding. Entitlement grants go to cities and counties and the state to, to, to do major projects, whether it's uh, storefront improvement or infrastructure, things like that, um, kind of building products in the city. Uh, and people will find C, uh, that kind of funding, CDBG, it's called community development block grants. COC funding, on the other hand, is, is really what helps us battle homelessness. This picture was taken in front of one of the buildings for the Ministry of Caring, uh, which is in Wilmington, Delaware. Brother Ronald uh, Giannone uh, is part of the Ministry of Caring. Um, this is what they do. We help supplement what they do. So you've heard of the old homeless shelters and the like. Um, <clears throat> that is, we help fund that. So we'll fund that through the state. The, the, you know, the state will apply to us for certain funding, and then they will then fund their partners out in the field. Um, keep going. And I think that's pretty much it. We also have our fair housing and equal opportunity, which I'm gonna talk about here. Um, fair housing and equal opportunity is run by Melody Taylor, also uh, a Delaware native. She's from Sussex County. Uh, we have a lot of Delaware influence in our HUD regional office. Uh, you know, the prior regional administrator before me, Jane Vincent was from Wilmington. So not to be upstage, I try to spend as much time in Delaware as possible. I went to law school in Wilmington and I live there. Uh, for a couple of years. This picture is with uh, County Executive Meyer and Mayor Przicki on $3 million that we gave uh, to Newcastle County for lead remediation. You see the smiling faces. Obviously, we're here to, to help the children. And like I said, as you can see from these photos and from what I talked about, we really are interested in working with our local partners. Um, there are HUD programs in a nutshell. I could go down a rabbit hole for the next hour and a half getting into the nuances, but I don't think you want to hear that, especially since we are good on time. Thank you. Very good. Saved by the red folder. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, DeFelice. Uh, that was wonderful. And uh, one of the things you said that you heard us in the business of building people. And we all know we have before the impact, before the impact of housing and what it means to all of us. So thank you for all those efforts. Picking up an echo, not sure what's up with that, but we'll move right along. Federal partner is the Small Business Administration. And my heavens, they have been busy the last few months as a result of CARES Act and, and uh, all the other activities and normal programs that they have. And with us is the Delaware State Director, John Fleming. So Mr. Fleming, the floor is yours. Take it away, sir. Good morning, good morning. Um, and and our, uh, we're almost afternoon, I guess now, but uh, thank you. Um, Again, I just have a couple of slides and a lot of information um, on where we are. And, um, you know, it's, it's an ever-changing program uh, and, and mission that we have here at SBA. So, um, actually, the slides are a little bit out of order. Could you go to the next slide? There's only two, uh, real quick. And then we'll come back to that next one. So. This is the overall um, services that SBA provides to small business. Basically, um, our mission is to help small businesses start, grow, and succeed. 
Uh, we're very, very lean agency. Our, our entire workforce um, is only about 1,800 people full time. Uh, that includes uh, 67 field offices, as well as our processing centers, and of course our headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, that's full time. Uh, these are the four main areas that we uh, provide small business services, and um, it's directly to small businesses in some cases, but in most cases, uh, these services are delivered through um, private partnerships with uh, other entities, and I'll go over some of those. Um, now, what we do in the last uh, bubble there is the disaster side, and that's what's getting all of the news and, and activity on where we are, and um, I'll cover those as well. So if we can go back to the first slide. Oh, there we go. Sorry to make you work a little bit here. Okay, I, it was my fault. I sent them in the wrong order. So um, let's talk about this. No, in, in normal times, we know we're not in normal times, but in normal times, our financial assistance programs um, are for basically any type of small business that is for profit and, um, and, and is small. Uh, we use the same size standards as the federal government, the rest of the federal government. Um, you, there's very, very few small businesses that are not eligible for SBA. Um, things like, um, uh, you know, not-for-profit businesses, some others that are that are not um, eligible. Um, so uh, it's easy. It's easier to tell us what we do, um, tell you what we can do rather than what we can't. So. Um, what, the way we deliver pro financial assistance to small businesses is primarily a hundred percent what's called the guarantee program. Uh, and uh, Joe earlier used the word insured. It's basically what it is. It works a lot of like a VA loan or or a, uh, a, a a FHA home loan, in that it's the it's the government guarantee that helps the person get approved, and it's the lender that actually lends the money. And of course, the benefit goes to the small business. Now, the way we work with our, uh, our, our one of our, our friends over at USDA is uh, they, there's certain businesses that they can't find. There's certain businesses that they uh, can, and um, you know we, we refer people back and forth. Uh, our loans are limited to five million dollars, so above that, uh, oftentimes we'll refer folks over to USDA, um, and really our role is to help the following small businesses. So if we run into a small business that is new uh, and, and needs financing, maybe they're less than uh, three years old, uh, that's an SBA customer. Uh, if, they have enough, if they don't have enough collateral for the loan, that is definitely an SBA um, type of uh, business. And, and also, um, if they need a longer time to pay off the loan. So these banks, these, these loans are done through lenders, through commercial banks. Uh, normally commercial bank will lend you uh, anywhere between three to 15 years on a commercial loan. With SBA, they can go from seven up to 25 years with an SBA guarantee. So it gives the small business owner some flexibility. Uh, there's no prepayment penalties on 99% um, of our loans. Uh, so that's how we that's how we help in in those areas uh, under normal financial times uh, under normal circumstances I should say um, and I'll get into some of the um, natural disasters is where we are uh, as my last slide so management training programs what we do there for in that in that area is we work with uh, centers such as the small business development center in every state. Uh, we also have a group of men and women that are volunteers called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, uh, and they are volunteers that help businesses uh, on, for free on a one-on-one -on -one basis as well as low-cost training. SCORE was actually started right here in Delaware as part of uh, retired uh, DuPont folks uh, over 50 years ago, wanted to give back to the community, started a program and, and started meeting with small businesses. And now it's nationwide. We have over 70,000 volunteers nationwide um, that help small businesses. Uh, we also have special outreach programs for uh, women, minorities, and armed forces. Uh, we have um, uh, women's centers. There's one in Wilmington. 
uh, on a, the Delaware Women's Center, uh, Business Women's Center. And uh, there's over 125 nationwide uh, that will specific pro provide specific programs targeted at women-owned businesses as well as minority-owned businesses. And we also have a, uh, a program for armed forces called VBOC, uh, Veterans Business Opportunity Center. And there are currently 35 of those throughout the country. Uh, it always depends on funding on how many we can open, but we're able to open a few each year on new ones. Um, and in addition to the VBOC centers that we have for uh, veterans, we also have um, a program called Boots to Business, and that's where we actually go on um, all of the major uh, military bases and help folks that are transitioning out of the armed services, uh, help them think about a small business, let them know what's out available out there. And um, that program we, we run in Delaware, we actually run it on, in uh, on Dover Air Force Base. The last um, uh, two months, three months has been virtual, um, but that's available as well. We, uh, I don't wanna forget federal contracting procurement assistance. What that does is, what that means is uh, Congress has given us the agency a mandate to make sure that at least 23% of all federal contracts go to small businesses. Uh, and we've uh, done a very, very good job of that. We've met all of our goals in the last, um, I'd say eight to 10 years now because of the way the program was revamped. Uh, we work with each agency to look at their individual goals uh, as well. And we, pr we, pr we provide a scorecard to Congress on how it, those agencies are doing uh, in the area of small business. Also, there are specific programs under federal contracting that are targeted for women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, and also armed force uh, uh, military veterans. Uh, so they, the, the programs are available. I have in my office in Delaware um, some of the best people in the country that can help small businesses get into the, get into the federal com contracting arena. Uh, we know it's difficult. We provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling and training uh, to those individuals to help them do that. And we've had uh, some of the big, big, biggest success stories in, in the country have come out of uh, Delaware, southern Delaware, specifically the Dover area as well. Um, we have an international trade area that we work with, and they are um, they do a number of things. They they work with uh, um, the foreign trade desks uh, of the Commerce Department to help promote small business uh, international trade. Uh, in addition to that, they they uh, have a, a grant program. So if you have a small business that is interested when, you know, when, when things start to open up again, if you have a small businesses that is interested in traveling um, overseas to make those connections for trade, uh, we have a grant program that will help small businesses um, uh, pay their expenses basically to uh, provide those trips. And so that program, um, there's, no, there's no target date on when they're gonna open that back up again. They are doing some virtual stuff um, but that's available as well. And that's the uh, International Trade uh, Assistance Program. And then last but not least, um, the, 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 <laughs> the program that's been um, really consuming our lives for the last five months now, it seems like forever, is the uh, disaster program. Uh, in this case, it says natural disaster, um, but what we're experiencing now is what, what we're classified as an economic uh, disaster, economic injury disaster. Uh, this program has always been around. It's a direct loan from the government. It's not a guaranteed program from the government. It's direct, uh, which gives us more flexibility. This has been around to help small businesses that um, need our assistance in normal times under floods, fires, uh, hurricanes, that type of thing. Um, and it's very active. It's run out of our Dallas center and they um, they use temporary employees when they need to and uh, expand uh, when they need to. Uh, now, under the current times, under COVID times, um, this program was put in immediately, declared disaster, and we provided um, our normal program, which is a third, up to a 30-year loan uh, for 3.75% interest rate, and it can be used to help businesses uh, sustain their business under these times. Um, that program, just to give you an idea, we uh, 
um, to date have received 14 million applications uh, for assistance. And that doesn't include the uh, hurricanes and floods and things you hear about, but that's just under uh, COVID relief, uh, 14 million applications. They are currently, have, we currently have 6,000 temporary workers that are working on those um, and uh, they're getting through them the best they can. That program is available at sba.gov. It's a direct loan again, and, and applications are being taken to the end of the calendar year, December 31st. Um, Congress is talking about different changes to it. You see it on the news, um, but that's the program we have. About two weeks after the disaster was declared um, and we went on lockdown, um, we created something called the PPP program, and that's what you see. It's called the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that's what you see on the news uh, almost every day. There's a comment about it, good, bad, or, or indifferent. Um, I can tell you that that program has been very successful. I'll give you an idea. Over 5 million applications um, approved. We, um, we have over six billion, $600 billion uh, that went uh, and funded small businesses through these times. Um, the idea of this program really uh, was to help businesses uh, maintain their payroll, uh, maintain their, their job level through a certain period. Uh, the changes come out on this daily uh, sometimes. And uh, we work in conjunction with um, the Treasury Department uh, in order to implement this program. There's uh, uh, some changes that are anticipated um, in the next couple of weeks on this program as well. Um, but to just give you an idea of, of how that works is once a business qualifies and they can qualify for up to $2 million under this program uh, and they can show that they have maintained their payroll uh, and, their, and their employee level at a certain level, then we will uh, allow them to apply what's called forgive for forgiveness, and meaning that the loan will become a grant if they use the, the, the funds properly. And um, it's, it's so far the, the, the uh, uh, forgiveness period is open uh, as of the beginning of August, and we started to receive applications for that. Um, last part, the last part of the disaster response that I wanted to mention, we, uh, Congress gave us money to, for any small business that had a current SBA loan when this hit, or any small business that was approved prior to the end of the fiscal year. We all know the new fiscal year starts October 1st. Uh, so anything prior to that approved under a new set, uh, SBA loan, uh, we'll, uh, we will pay the monthly principal and interest payments for six months if you, have an, if you had an ex existing SBA loan or received a new uh, loan during that time period. Um, there were, there was money, um, there will be money in this program going next year. I'm not sure if they're going to extend it. That's part of the new bill as well. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So, um, in terms of how we can help, um, our website, sba.gov, uh, we are, um, I have a, I have an office of just seven people here in Delaware, um, but professionals that can help you. We're all working remotely. And um, we're trying to get the word out and assist many, as many small businesses as we can. Um, looks like I did not use all of my time, so that'll help a little bit. Um, that's what I got for you today. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. And I just can't imagine 14 million applications <laughs> as a result of the COVID activity. What a, a testament to you, you guys and, and your staff all across the country for for stepping up to the plate and all the temporary workers to, to keep that rolling along. And how fabulous Thanks. score was created right there in Delaware. I, again, a testimony to the, the, the folks there in rural America and Delaware that um, you know, still continue to deliver those great programs across, across the country and help all kinds of small business owners. And before I forget to the, the whole audience, um, as I just got an email from SBA in, in Delaware from your your Gov Delivery system, please sign up for all of our notification systems through Gov Delivery and all on our websites. That will keep you engaged with the, the latest and the greatest of funding opportunities, news, and um, new things that come down the pike. So be sure to take advantage of that from all, all of us, both state and nationally, after today.
So um, next we'll move right along into um, continue with our other federal partners, the Federal Reserve Bank, um, uh, another agency that has certainly gotten lots of attention in recent months and, and certainly understandable with all the, the economic challenges that, that are on the horizon for us. And with us this morning, or um, my apologies, this afternoon, is Community Development Analyst Alvaro Sanchez, who has joined us. And we thank you for your efforts, uh, first of all, and we thank you for being here. And he represents the third Federal Reserve District, which he'll tell you about that. And he's an um, analyst with economic growth and mobility. Interesting title there. So, Mr. Sanchez, take it away, please, sir. Thanks, Ann. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's work around broadband access in the third district. And the third district is considered Eastern Pennsylvania, the Eastern part of it, uh, Southern New Jersey and uh, Delaware. So uh, I'll just get right into it. Um, but first, oh, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, first, uh, there's a standard disclaimer that uh, all of the Federal Reserve analysts and governors and everyone uses right before we do uh, a presentation. So I'll, I'll just say that now. The views expressed here are those of the presenter, whom is myself, and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia or the Federal Reserve System. Okay, so we can go ahead and get to the next slide. So folks might be wondering, you know, why the Philadelphia Fed or the Federal Reserve System cares about broadband access and what, is, what does that have to do with our dual mandate? What does that have to do with, with what we're doing in the Federal Reserve System? Well, about three years ago, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia started what is known as the Economic Growth and Mobility Project. Uh, and it's a newer initiative by my bank uh, that is dedicated to promoting equal access to economic opportunity for all. Um, and what we do is we leverage our two strengths, which are our research expertise, but then also our ability to convene stakeholders in different uh, sectors of our regional economies around issues of economic importance. And we uh, convene and do research around currently three bucketed areas, and those are infrastructure equity, workforce development, and job creation. And so today we'll be focusing on the infrastructure bucket uh, and obviously within broadband. So we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so before I get into talking about the research that we've done on broadband, I wanted to highlight the three data sources that we've used uh, through our initial study, which was released in March, just before we began working from home. Uh, and then uh, a more recent research brief on Philadelphia and the United States and broadband access. So uh, we used First and foremost, the FCC Form 477 fixed broadband deployment data. We don't use cellular uh, data. Um, we don't use satellite data. We look at fixed wireline broadband services. And those are DSL, cable, uh, and fiber optic to the home. We also use the US Decennial Census and the uh, Census's American Community Survey to look at uh, population and demographic patterns of broadband access and, and broadband subscription, things like that. So next slide, please. So uh, the research questions that we focused the research, the reports around uh, were kind of, they were simple. We wanted to know what share of the rural and urban uh, third district stakeholders uh, had fixed wireline broadband available in their neighborhoods. But then we also wanted to understand where broadband subscription rates might vary, might, you know, might be lackluster, might, might lag behind the regional average. And uh, so then we also put that lens of not only broadband availability, but then also the extent to which folks in a neighborhood might be actually subscribing to it, the uptake of broadband as well. Um, and then we also wanted to understand what the characteristics of three kinds of neighborhoods that we've identified are. And those are unserved neighborhoods, they're low uptake neighborhoods, and they're high uptake neighborhoods. So next slide, please. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to explain what those neighborhoods were. So unserved neighborhoods are tracks where broadband is not widely, widely deployed. It's pla there are, those are places that broadband infrastructure is not actually physically present or not to the extent that it ought to be for a neighborhood to be considered served. Low uptake neighborhoods are tracks where broadband is widely deployed, uh, but subscription rates fall below the third district average. So those are just places where household uptake is low. And then high uptake neighborhoods are places where broadband infrastructure is physically present and broadband subscription rates exceed the average in the third district. So next slide, please. 
So initially in the first study, what we found was that fixed wireline broadband tends to be less available in rural communities or what we call non-metropolitan areas uh, than in the metropolitan areas in the third district overall. And you'll notice that uh, the basic speed with which we're going to be focusing throughout this presentation is 25 megabits per second download, three megabits per second upload. Um, you know, that, that's the FCC uh, definition of what broadband is, but we also wanted to understand at greater bandwidths and when folks need higher data processing, uh, what does what availability look like in terms of physical presence of interest, infrastructure? So as you go to increased bandwidth speeds, you'll notice that overall broadband becomes less available for pretty much everyone, uh, especially in rural areas. And then as you get up to that uh, gigabit speed of 1000 megabits per second download, uh, you'll notice that it, it's, it's not available to over half of residents in the third district. So the remainder, again, the remainder of this presentation focuses on broadband uh, at 25.3, that threshold. Uh, so next slide, please. We also wanted to look at the three uh, technologies that we're focusing on and, and where those are available at 25.3 again. So you'll notice that cable modem tends to be the most widely available technology uh, that is serving residents in the third district. Um, followed by fiber optic cable and then DSL. And the reason why DSL tends not to be available is because DSL is an older technology and it actually tends to provide broadband at speeds lower than 25.3, that basic threshold. So that, that technology does tend to be widely available. It's just not serving folks at the speed with which it needs to be uh, in order for folks to be connected and, and sending things and receiving things and doing work. But additionally, uh, you'll notice that uh, broadband at ca uh, cable modem broadband and fiber optic broadband in rural regions tends to be less available. And in particular, that fiber optic category uh, is important to consider because fiber optic is what uh, is a sort of this, this next technology, this next generation technology in fixed wireline deployment. Um, so I guess, you know, we can get into the next slides as well. Um, here, I wanted to sort of actually illustrate where fiber optic to the home is available. Um, and you'll notice that in the third district, Eastern PA, and you're looking at Eastern PA, Southern New Jersey, and then of course, Delaware down there, uh, you'll notice that fiber service is concentrated in those high population density areas. Those areas where there are larger cities and medium sized, medium -sized cities like Harrisburg, Reading, Bethlehem and Allentown and especially Philadelphia. But then as you get uh, into more rural areas of the third district, fiber optic to the home, that next generation technology is just not available, especially in places like State College or Williamsport, places that are really emerging. Um, and so that presents a pretty clear disparity in broadband availability between regions, but then also within regions. Uh, so next slide, please. So the next part of the report that uh, we got into was where households were subscribing to broadband and the neighborhood characteristics of those uh, places that tended to uh, not have high broadband subscription. So you'll notice that low and moderate income communities, uh, places that uh, have a median household income of less than 80%, or rather a median household income at 80% of a region's median household income tended to have lower subscription rates. And then you'll notice that rural regions also tended to have lower subscription rates. So next slide, please. And then also uh, Latino or Hispanic neighborhoods, predominantly Latino or Hispanic neighborhoods and predominantly black neighborhoods tended to have lower broadband subscription compared to the third district and their white counterparts, their predominantly white neighborhood counterparts. And so it just really goes to show that vulnerable neighborhoods show lower subscription rates. Next slide, please. So then as we get into this broadband topology that I mentioned, you'll notice that in the third district, uh, most, most of the population live in high uptake neighborhoods, those places where broadband is available and subscription rates exceed the third district average. Okay, let's uh, skip about two or three slides. And we'll go to the, uh, the next slide. So 
now that we know where broadband subscription rates sort of lag and, and where and you know where they're exceeding in the kinds of neighborhoods, we also started to get into how broadband to how that broadband topology relates to labor force participation and then unemployment. So uh, in analyzing labor market uh, attachment, what we found was that there are large disparities in the labor force particip participation rate between na uh, neighborhoods uh, that are low uptake and high uptake neighborhoods. You'll see that you know the largest disparities in labor force participation are in places where workers tend to be older and workers have a disability. So next slide, please. And then you'll notice that that pattern of uh, disparity in unemployment persists, but uh, uh, between low uptake and high uptake neighborhoods. But those disparities are with workers without a degree, black workers and among workers with a disability. So next slide, please. So here, what you'll see is an analysis we did on Philadelphia, um, and then it'll show that neighborhoods that tend to have lower broadband subscription also, and this makes sense, but they also tend to have lower computer use, and they also tend to be places where that dot size and color illustrates where folks are living in poverty. So there's a higher concentration of poverty when there's a lack of broadband access and a lack of computer use. Next slide, please. And what we found is nationally, there's a 21 percentage point gap and the labor force participation rate between workers with and without a broadband enabled computer. And in Philadelphia, the gap is even larger. And we're doing additional research and we're finding that this pattern persists in Delaware and in other regions and we'll, that's forthcoming research. But uh, the next slide, please. And then additionally, when we looked at unemployment rates, there is a four percentage point gap between workers with and without a broadband enabled computer. And that, that that's a national stat, but then in Philadelphia, it's even larger. And again, this pattern persists in Delaware as well. So let's actually go to the next slide. Um, and so the next, let's go to the next slide actually. So what can we do? Um, obviously connecting residents to low and no cost broadband services, especially through the pandemic is really important, but then expanding funding opportunities for schools to invest in laptops and mobile hotspots is critical. This can also be a linking mechanism for their parents that might have lost a job or that might be struggling to get connected in their own households. Um, and then also digital literacy and skills programs are essential. You can't just give people broadband access. You can't just give people a computer and expect them to understand how to apply those things. You got to give them digital literacy and skills programs at an affordable price. And then also ongoing mapping and network upgrade programs are seriously important because the mapping that we have currently right now and the data that we're using is not is not the best, it can get better and all data can be better, but especially uh, data from the FCC on where broadband is available. So uh, that's all I've got today. Thanks for bearing with me, Chandra. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you know, like Denise alluded to earlier, rural development is in the broadband business, but I have learned a new word, topology. So that's the buzzword of the day. We've all got to remember that. And, and I think it's just fabulous that, uh, you know, your bank in particular is focusing in on that. It's the, the newest form of critical infrastructure in rural communities, in, in case you all did not know that. So keep your ears peeled for more good works in that. So thank you again. We certainly appreciate you joining us this morning. Okay, last but not least on our uh, list of federal partners is the Internal Revenue Service, the Big Bad IRS. And we have two ladies joining us this, or this afternoon. Uh, they are both communication and liaison outreach specialists. And we have Ms. Georgia Thomas and Brenda Stewart Luke with us. And ladies, I'm not sure if you're both going or one of you, but the floor is yours. So thank you for joining us. All right, I'll go first. This is uh, Georgia Thomas and um, I am a area manager for stakeholder liaison, which is part of communication and liaison. Uh, as the name implies, we do outreach and education for the Internal Revenue Service. And uh, we also handle the disaster program, uh, like many of uh, the other agencies have spoken about. We um, actually provide a, a service during disaster relief times in terms of providing information so that persons understand that they can uh, amend prior tax returns um, or go forward in terms of determining a, a loss and taking that loss to try to get hold during the period of disaster. Uh, but what we want to talk about or 
Brother, what Brenda's going to talk with you about today has to do with the CARES Act. Uh, but I wanted to uh, let you know that stakeholder liaison is divided into four areas. Uh, we have stakeholder liaisons across the country who provide that outreach and education. And our area in particular is area four. Uh, we have, uh, as part of our charge to provide that education to um, primarily persons in Texas, uh, the state of Georgia, uh, Florida, North and South Carolina, and then New York. However, um, we've had conversations with uh, executives with the uh, USDA, and so we got invited today to speak to you here in Delaware, and we really appreciate having um, the opportunity. Um, because the CARES Act has affected, uh, as one of the other speakers indicated, the economic security of all taxpayers. And so we want to make sure that all Americans understand that they uh, are able to claim this particular uh, credit. So without further ado, um, uh, Brenda will t take over. I'll leave leave you from Texas and she'll start from New York. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yes, I'm a senior stakeholder liaison. Georgia is my manager. And I thank you for the opportunity to be able to participate in your meeting today. And today what I'm gonna to talk about is the CARES Act as it impact the IRS and what IRS part was with this CARES Act. And if you could go to the next slide, Particularly, we're going to talk about the economic impact payment. A lot of people know that as the stimulus payment. So basically what it is, it, it's a recovery rebate or an advanced refund that was provided in legislation. So um, next slide. So this here CARES Act, which provided the economic impact payment, it was payments that was issued to taxpayers that were American citizens or resident aliens. So as it states, $2,400 was for two eligible individuals filing a joint return. $1,200 for, was for each eligible individuals and $500 was given to each qualifying child, which was claimed as an eligible individual. As of now, we have sent out several payments and what i wanted to say also a lot of these payments have not been received and in addition individuals will also be receiving information in the mail and irs will be also sending out letters that will be mailed and it would be a special letter that would go to an estimated nine million non-filers urging them also to claim their economic impact payment and this would be done by october October 15th. Next slide. As, as stated before, this would be payment up to $500 for each qualifying child that would be under the age of 16. Next slide. As we stated, what is the qualification in terms of the annual uh, gross income? That would be married filing joint. It would be 150,000. Head of household would be 112,500, and as well as single, it would be 75,000. So that would be the eligibility for these individuals. And there would be a reduction also for those that made over that amount. Next slide. We go to the next slide as well. Next slide. So we have more details about this higher uh, income taxpayers that would be with qualifying child. Next slide. Now, one of the uh, people, I should say persons that were not eligible would be dependents who could be claimed on someone else's tax return or non-resident aliens. That would be individuals that did not have a valid social security number. So individuals that had valid social security numbers, they would be eligible. Next slide. 
as I stated before, valid taxpayer identification numbers must be shown for the individual, the, the, the persons that had valid socials, and also the adoption uh, taxpayer identification number for qualifying children as well. Next slide. So IRS started sending these payments out also to individuals that typically would file a tax return. When we originally started March 27, it would for those that was had filed a 2018 tax return. And at that point in time, the uh, filing season had been extended to July 15th. So it, at that point in time, when we originally started, the 2019 tax return wasn't required. But as of now, we would encourage individuals to go ahead and apply for this prior to October 15. So payment would be issued by direct deposit. And if no direct deposit information was available, the payment would be sent by mail. And that could be at that point in time, as well as now, it could have been in the form of a check or either a direct debit card. Next slide. People who typically was, would not file a tax return also would be eligible. You might say, who would that be? That would be individuals that receive Social Security, that would be SSDI, or individuals such as low-income workers, certain veterans, and individuals with disability. And that's why we're very happy to work with the other federal agencies, such as you you because of the fact that we're looking for advocates to help get to the community to make them aware that they may be entitled to this economic impact payment and this should be done before october 15. so we are eagerly looking forward to working with you and please help get this information out to the communities and to organizations and to persons that may be eligible also that typically would not file a tax return and which we'll talk more about that that they're listed or identified as non-filers next slide so for security reason irs plans to mail a letter for this economic impact payment to the last known address within 15 days after the payment is made so one of the things that we're even encouraging now is if you've moved or you have a change of address, let the IRS know, because if not, we're going by the last address that's on file, or we need to update it with your current information. That's also if you do a refund from the IRS. So we encourage you to please, if you had a change of address, let us know so that we can help you. So also you would receive a letter after you receive that payment advising you about that and confirming it so that you would know that it's not a scam. Next slide. The economic impact payment, if you go to irs.gov, you will see two portals. One would be get your payment. The other would be the non-filer payment here. We're gonna talk about that. What how they should be used, and also how you can help other individuals utilize this tool as well. Next, next slide. So the information that's available, you want to check the status of your economic impact payment. There's various reasons why you would not receive it. So when you go to irs.gov and you type in economic impact payment, you would see our frequently asked questions, which we, which we will discuss, you will find out why there's reasons that you not, you did not receive the payment. Next slide. Get my payment. The get my payment tool allows you to find out an update with your information, your banking information, as it says, it's going to ask for your date of birth your street address, and also your zip code. It allows you to update our system with your information. I must add, doing mission critical, all of us mostly was working at home. And so some of the offices were closed. So I do apologize that some people that might have sent in their tax return by paper, or they might even sent in a letter requesting information why they did not receive their refund or even their economic impact payment. But because 
of COVID, the offices were closed and the mail was there. However, people are going back to work right now. And however, these electronic features such as these portals were active. So please, I would say utilize this information. And also I will share a phone number at the end of my presentation that individuals can call to actually find out about the economic impact payment. Okay, next slide. The non-filer tool is a tool that is utilized or could be utilized by individuals that typically would not file a tax return. So it allows you to update with your information. It allows you to put in your address and update it with your current information that you have now. That way we would have that. And you also, we would then be able to send you a, a the economic impact payment. So these would be individuals typically that would not file. So this information is available. Now we had a short turnaround previously where uh, we encouraged, this was back in May, where we were able to, uh, if you were taking care of, let's say your grandparent taking care of a child or you were on social security disability and you had a qualifying child, the time frame has uh, had closed very shortly. However, we reopened it and there is a short time frame that we need to uh, go forward with letting people know that there is a short deadline, which would be September 30th. Okay, so as we said, we go to the next slide. Okay, again, this is enter our payment. I know I'm running short, I'm getting loose. So basically what I wanna encourage everyone is all this information is valuable. We have frequently asked questions that would actually, any question that you might have is updated daily in reference to the economic impact payment. You could go forward. And what I will do as I'm wrapping up is I will share with you our number. You've, we encourage individuals also to go to free file. This also gives a picture of the non-filer tool that in, in case that you wanted to utilize this to update it with your information. Okay, go ahead. You can go forward. You can go forward. Okay. So basically, this is what the tool looked like here on irs.gov, uh, where it talks about the coronavirus, the tax relief information. We have that there and it gives you get my payment. What I wanted to share with you be, as I wrap up, there is a telephone number of 1-800-919-9835. This is a number if individuals have questions about the economic impact payment and they have not received that right now. And the only other thing I wanted to add as a reminder, I know that during this here, uh, pandemic time, people, some people received uh, unemployment. I just want to encourage individuals that unemployment is taxable and they should be making estimated tax payments. And we have this information available. And if they're to make an estimated tax payment, this head payment is due September 15th. So I thank you. We are available for questions and we thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of your meeting today. Thank you, ladies, and thank you for all the good works that you all do at the Internal Revenue Service, one of those agencies that we don't realize how much we need you until we need you. So thanks again for joining us today. Okay, we are getting close to the, the, the final few minutes here, but we do want to allow some more question and answers, and I think Sandra, Chandra has a, a poll to start off with for a little extra engagement. I think, Chandra, you're still doing the poll? Here we go. Yes. Um, since we do have those five priority areas and many of the agencies touched on a priority area in one form or another, from your standpoint and your organization, how are you, um, what is the, which out of the five, what's your priority moving forward in the next 12 months that we can make sure that we rally around and create a round table so we can have that discussion or provide additional resources through another smaller summit so we can move forward with um, meeting the needs of you, our participants, as well as those um, community residents and um, 
stakeholders that we all represent. So I'll give you another 15 seconds to answer or consider. Again, it's e-connectivity in rural areas, economic development, harnessing technolo technological innovations, supporting the rural workforce, as well as improving a quality of life. So thank you for all for participating. Um, we will, again, provide information for you um, after the summit wrapped up, packaged, so you can be able to use it and move forward, but also be able to contact each of the agents that we have available. All right, so I will end the poll. Thank you. Gosh, almost a three-way tie. Interesting. Between e-connectivity, supporting rural workforce, and improving quality of life. Okay, well, folks, it does not appear that we have any questions in the chat or that anyone has raised their hand, but it, if you do, right quick, we'll give it maybe one more minute and then roll right on along into the, the final uh, wrap up and um, call to action and final closing remarks. And again, we certainly appreciate you sticking with us today. So fabulous information rolling along. All right. Well, the call to action was to make sure that we understood what was going to be the next steps or what was the top priorities for us to focus on as a state as well as as a region with these agents that we have um, participating as a panel discussion today. So next, I would like to turn it over to um, with our closed remarks because I know time is of essence. And so we want to make sure that we use your time wisely and, and, and not splurge. But thank you everyone for being here and we will begin our closing remarks with who's the first one um, well we have two we have denise lovelady again the state director for usda rural development and then the next one who is is new to our, our lineup i'll go ahead and introduce her as well so they can keep rolling that's allison johnson she's the a national outreach coordinator with the office of public or I'm sorry, partnerships and, and public engagement for the East. So I believe Shonda, you probably work with her a good bit. So the so ladies, we'll turn it over to you. Denise, uh, it is your turn next. Denise, are you out there? Oh, I was muted and my video is off. Hang on, there, there I am, I'm not technical challenge. Chandra, thank you, but you needed one more button on your, your poll there. You needed all of the above as far as rural development is concerned. <laughs> um, so remember this presentation, as Chandra said, this is just the first step and I think Allison will talk more about that. But um, I wanna thank all of our federal and state partners presenting this morning. They shared a wealth of information about their agencies <clears throat> that can certainly benefit your organization. And I wanna leave you with this. This morning while I was having a cup of coffee and scanning social media, I came across an interesting comment written by a state official from Maryland, but this might also be true of Delaware and other states. He writes that the state closed out their books for fiscal year 2020 by announcing a large fund balance. I thought to myself, how could that be while we're navigating through COVID-19 and all the challenges? He goes on to say, uh, he goes on to state that the state benefited in a large measure by successful federal stimulus policies, federal reserve board policies meant to keep money circulating through the US economy, and even the fact that income tax withholding receipts managed to perform better than anticipated in this time of historically high levels of unemployment. So I wanna thank President Trump and his administration for their leadership. And please remember, we are from the federal government and we are here to help. Y'all have a great day and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Denise, for those parting words. And now we'll move right on over to Allison Johnson. And it is your turn. Thank you again well, for thank joining you. us. Thank you. And thank you for hosting this summit. Uh, it's exciting to me because Louisiana is hosting one next week and I think you guys gave me uh, jitters today. I thought I was 
ready and prepared and uh, seeing how prepared you all were and how smoothly uh, your your summit went today. I, I was excited for you though and really excited for uh, Chandra and the work that she's done and the effort she put into the summit. She was bound and determined to work with uh, and, and the Rural Development State Director there were bound to get this thing done. I mean we had they had some hiccups. We had to change the dates and uh, still pull this thing off of Delaware. So I'm excited uh, for you all today. Uh, it was a very successful summit. I uh, really appreciate the partners coming and, and contributing with the presentations and all of the national partners that we've had that participated in most of the summits nationwide. Thank you so much because we are taking from your schedule and your time as well. And you know, we're all busy, uh, especially here in Louisiana, trying to line up the summit for next week. Laura's hit and I just realized, you know, we're all very taxed right now. So I really appreciate the partners taking out time uh, in their schedules with their agencies and departments and coming to support the effort of, of USDA with this initiative. So uh, congratulations again, Delaware. We appreciate you. Thank you for hosting this for uh, uh, the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement and congratulations, Chandra and uh, SPAC of Delaware. Thanks again. Thank you, Allison. Chandra, did you have anything else? No, I just wanted to say thank to er thanks to everyone who stayed on the call as well as received the information. We'll move forward with making connections because we are building Delaware um, more and more as well as our surrounding states. But we wanna make sure that the opportunities that are available, we take advantage of. So with everyone moving forward, have a great day and a good weekend and we will see you next time for the next summit. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us again. Have a great rest of your day.